Hey, what's going on, everyone? I'm Vinny Costa, editor of Street Muscle Magazine and your host of the Rodcast by Lucas Oil. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, Greg Acosta, editor of Engine Labs and the all-around tech guru. What's up, Greg? Yo, how you doing, Vinny? I'm doing well, man. Doing well. Uh, today is an exciting episode, and I know I say that every episode, <laughs> but it is exciting, man, because uh, today is the finale of our super muscle car, or, or, excuse me, our mid-engine supercar shootout. Um, we started with the Corvette, then we went on to the Audi R8, then we went on to the McLaren 720S, then we did the Acura NSX Type S, and now we are capping things off with the Ferrari, uh, I'm sorry, Tributo F8. Yeah, that's... Uh... It's the car that we've been waiting to build for a while. I know Rob is super excited yes. about it. <laughs> um, I think this is the one that Rob is just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's been chomping at the bit, man. He really, he wants this one. So do I. I'm a big Ferrari fan, but uh, obviously he's got a tremendous amount of knowledge on the company itself and uh, and the Tributo. So uh, I'm eager to get into it. Um, I think... Yeah, I think we'll just dive into it. But yeah. uh, before we do, let's let's take a word from our sponsor. Gentlemen, it's Sir. time. Captain, my captain. <laughs> Welcome back to another fun-filled episode. Uh, today's the finale, sort of, sort of, kind of, because uh, we might. Well, today's the finale, right? We're building us a Ferrari, right? And uh, that's pretty cool because the other people that get to say that are doing it with their bare hands, right? This um, is the one I've been waiting for personally, and I think everybody out there. Is going to enjoy this one not only is it a ferrari but we're going to see you know between ferrari and that mclaren that the three of us were drooling over which car is is top dog it could be nip and tuck you never know yeah you're not kidding um yeah. this has been a long awaited uh episode for i think all three of us um uh because it's like the opposite end of that spectrum right so we started with the corvette and the whole point of all this was to see where the Corvette stacks up against uh, some of its um, most notorious uh, rivals, as it were, um, in that mid-engine, uh, you know, class. And the Ferrari is like, like you said, Rob, the top dog, the the furthest echelon. Yeah, and, uh, well, it's it's considered the car we're going to review is the Ferrari F8 Tributo, which is their mid-engine uh, supercar. And yeah, it's pretty much considered, um, you know, the bellwether uh, car in this segment that everything else is compared to. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to compare it. See I'm excited, you, you guys. Yeah, me too. Um, okay, so in the past few episodes, we've uh, launched into a history of the manufacturer and the actual car itself um, before you know, actually building the car and then discussing our likes and dislikes. So Rob, I know that you are a massive uh, Ferrari fanatic. Um, wait, what's the, what's, yeah, what's, what's the, the name Ferrari people? They're called Tifosi in Italy, T-I-F-O-S-I, -I, the Ferrari fanatics that go to Formula One races and shave their heads and paint Ferrari logos on their, tattoo them on their heads and stuff. Are so, they like yeah. soccer hooligans? Like, will they, will uh, they headbutt not, you for saying that? Ask no, me they're not violent typically, but they are, they literally live vicariously through the, uh, through the successes and failures of Ferrari and Formula One. So I've actually got to experience that firsthand. I went to Monza for the Italian Grand Prix in, in 2011 and uh, just like the level of fandom there puts like college football to shame. I mean, these are people literally with Ferrari tattoos all over them. And, you know, they they body paint themselves with Ferrari logos all over and they'll sob if, you know, 
uncontrollably if a Ferrari drops out of the race. And uh, it was pretty wild. It was now, now here's Is a real that... question. Do they have Ferraris? No, none of them can afford Ferraris. But that's the whole point of Ferrari. And we're going to get into that, that there are certain things in this world you know, I'm not a super materialistic guy. In fact, the only thing I really spend money on is cars. Uh, I'm not a clothes horse and I'm not a, you know, like that stuff doesn't matter to me. Cars matter to me and I spend money on it. But there are a few th products in the world, uh, brands really, that are aspirational. And uh, Ferrari is probably the top one in the world. There was a study, I think it was about 10 years ago in which they showed, uh, they did like a thousand people from all over the world, even like countries in Africa and stuff like Djibouti and, and the Congo or whatever. And they showed them uh, logos and corporate, um, you know, corporate logos. And the most recognized logo in the entire world, according to that study, was the prancing horse of Ferrari. Really? More than Jordan, huh? More than that, more than the Mercedes star, more than... Nike? Anything. More than... More than Nike, more than anything. Wow. Everybody around the world knows, you know, the prancing horse logo. See, that surprises but, me because you would think, you know, whether you're in something a little more third world or something high end, the Mercedes logo... Because, yeah, because you, know, you actually and, see those yeah. cars, but they see that's the point. There's an aspirational nature to Ferrari. So few people ever get the privilege of owning one, but yet so many people are entranced by the myth, the, the legend, the, the history of Ferrari that it becomes like you ask 100 people if, if they were given a check for $10 million, what would be the first thing they buy? Someone in there is going to say a Ferrari. Someone will say a Ferrari. I would, you know. So, uh, yeah, so there's a great history to this country, uh, company, and um, should we get into it? Or did you have... Uh, Something else you wanted to mention, Vinny? No, no, no. I um, I just, you know, I'm, I'm anxiously waiting, like the rest of our audience, to hear, yeah, the fabled history of uh the brand Ferrari, uh, what makes it so, um, you know, recognized uh, the world over, and uh, this particular model of Ferrari as well. Yeah. Um. Well, Ferrari, uh, the company has its roots uh, all the way back in the 1920s, actually. Enzo Ferrari um, uh, was a young aspirational uh, mechanic and who had designs on being involved in, in those days, what was called Grand Prix racing. Uh, there wasn't yet um, like the sports division known as Formula One. Uh, but there had been racing all over the streets and racetracks of Europe pre-war. And it was just loosely known as Grand Prix. And there were no real rules behind uh, engine displacement or configuration or front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, four wheel drive. It was pretty much up for grabs. And uh, in 1929, uh, Enzo Ferrari... Uh, created a company called uh, Scuderia Ferrari. Scuderia in Italian basically just meaning stable, like a horse's stable. So it's the stable of Ferrari. And he chose that name very particularly because um, he had recently met a, a countess, an Italian countess, uh, who was the mother of a famous count, uh, Francesco uh, Baracca, I believe was his name, who was a World War I fighter pilot. He was an ace, um, meaning he had shot down more than five aircraft during World War I. And he was this legendary guy, kind of like the Red Baron uh, was for Germany. Uh, Baraka was the Italian version of the Red Baron, and he was killed towards the end of World War I. He was shot down, and his coat of arms that he used to paint on his airplane 
um, was a prancing horse that was part of their family's crest. Their family crest included a, a horse rearing up on its hind legs. And um, uh, the Countess was so enchanted when she met Enzo Ferrari, she said, please, when you form your racing team, he was telling her how one day he was gonna own a racing team. She said, when you start your company, I want my son's logo to feature in your logo for the company. And Enzo agreed. And based on the fact that the logo was a prancing horse, Enzo decided to name his racing company Scuderia Ferrari, which means like the horse's stable of Ferrari. And sure enough, he used the prancing horse from uh, Baraka's airplane and incorporated it into a logo that had the tricolor flag, the uh, red, white, and green of Italy on a yellow background, yellow being the color of the region of Italy that uh, Enzo was from, which was called Modena. And uh, what he promptly set out doing was building race cars for Alfa Romeo, which at the time was the premier brand in Italy, the most powerful uh, and most well-known uh, sports car company and racing company. And so he did that uh, for several years. And then uh, because of some machinations between Alfa and Enzo Ferrari, he ended up uh, leaving Alfa Romeo and decided to start building his own racing cars. And so in 1943, during the middle of World War II, he built a factory in Marinello, which is um, uh, in the west, sort of northwest side of uh, the Italian uh, peninsula. And um, he, he built a Ferrari factory there and started uh, building race cars. Well, towards the invasion of Italy, uh, when the Allies uh, invaded Italy, the, his factory was bombed uh, because it was uh, mistaken for an armaments plant. They didn't realize he was just building race cars. And uh, the factory was destroyed. It was uh, rebuilt post-war. And uh, he started building race cars again under the Ferrari name using the Prancing Horse logo. But racing was a very expensive proposition in those days because there was really no sponsorship. Uh, these days, re, uh, starting a racing firm can, can be very profitable because if you attract big name sponsors, they'll just pour money into your team and in turn you can develop the best race cars and win a lot um, and then sell a lot of souvenirs and t-shirts and so forth. There's many ways to make money in racing. In those days, the only way that racing teams made money was based on winning races and you'd get prize money. Um, and that was a pretty difficult way to, to support the manufacturing of race cars through a company. Um, so reluctantly in 1947, Enzo decided to support his racing activities. He was going to use the company's mechanical know-how to build a streetcar, and they were going to sell streetcars uh, to uh, to finance his racing activities, which was his true love in life. And it's interesting to think that most racing teams that are owned by big car companies like Mercedes or Honda or what have you, it's always car companies that go racing. OK, like their main business is to sell streetcars and they get into racing, uh, uh, you know, to improve their their streetcars by learning things, technical things uh, for uh, racing, like in terms of endurance and performance and fuel efficiency. Ferrari, since its very inception, was the other way around. It was a racing team that sold cars and it still is to this day. 
Um, you know, streetcars for Ferrari are almost an afterthought. Uh, it was and is a racing company that just happens to sell cars. And so the first actual street Ferrari was known as the 125S. It was produced in 1947. It had a V12 uh, Ferrari built engine. And uh, suddenly the Ferrari company was in the streetcar business from that point on. And very quickly, people around the world realized the... Uh, the attention to detail in Ferrari's road cars, the performance that was all Grand Prix derived. And uh, by 1950, which is when Formula One as a uh, sporting body was formed, uh, Ferrari was on board at the very first race. And so to this day, they, Ferrari is the oldest continuous Formula One team uh, in history. And uh, they had tremendous success in Formula One, which really enhanced the allure of their streetcars because people knew if you bought a Ferrari streetcar, you were buying years of Formula One and before that Grand Prix racing experience in your car. In 1969, Ferrari was bought by Fiat, which became the uh, ultimately the largest car company in the world at the time. And that was after a, a negotiations between Ford and Ferrari had fallen through. Uh, Ford initially was going to buy Ferrari as a halo brand. And as we've discussed before, that fell through and uh, led to Ford designing the GT40 because there were bad feelings between the two companies when the deal fell through. Uh, they built the GT40 to, to, to beat Ferrari at Le Mans and give them the middle finger for, for you know, the breakdown of that deal. And so Fiat uh, had owned Ferrari from 1969 until quite recently in 2014 uh, Fiat Chrysler decided to spin off Ferrari as an independent company, and they did a, uh, an initial public offering and IPO, and Ferrari is now a, a widely held public company. And um, in 1988, Enzo Ferrari died, the very last car that he oversaw the production of was the F40, the fabled F40. And he died, I think, two weeks before the car was actually released. It was already designed and being built, but it hadn't been released to the world yet. And uh, in tribute to him, naturally, uh, in more recent years, Ferrari built the Enzo, which was a successor to the F40, using the company founder's name, Enzo, to, uh, to commemorate him uh in uh on their you know top offering a hypercar really the world's first true hypercar hmm. so in a nutshell that's that's basically the ferrari history it's a fabled fabled country uh company that um really the whole country of italy um you know lives and breathes ferrari there's a relationship between ferrari and its na national um, sort of psyche, if you will, um, that's unlike anything else in the world, you know. Yeah. There's no passion like the Italians have for Ferrari in America, like no one lives and mm. dies by Ford. Uh, mm. or, yeah, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I disagree. I totally really? disagree. Mm. On that point, yes. Um, really? Yeah, I mean, they're you know, I think you go to Italy and to the Italian Grand Prix and reevaluate that. Hey, no, go to the local mud bogs and reevaluate yeah. whether there's some boys. <laughs> <on> the <chin. laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I don't. You know, I'm. I, hey, I've been wrong in the past, so I'm not going to say you're you're completely wrong, Rob. But at this point in my life, I disagree. Um, Fair but enough. But who knows? I might go to Italy one day. Hopefully, uh, actually, I have been there, um, but I didn't spend any. Uh, very much time there um but 
thank you for that download, first of all, uh, Rob. And then also, like, I, th I thought it was interesting, you know, as I listened to the history of the company, um, there were a couple of points that I, I really, that stood out to me uh, in the, in the beginning, when you started naming some of the, uh, uh, the models and you started talking about, um, you know, their ties to um, locations and, uh, you know, family and things like that. It mm -hmm. started all to make sense, right? Where does this pride come from? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it started very early, you know, at the very beginning, yeah, um, really at the origins. Yeah. It's because, it, you know, it's, it's tied to uh, family, it's tied to um, the creator. And then, you know, you have these models that are named after places that he lived and, and those are Italian places, right? Those are, uh, yeah. you know, places that are to still this, around. Yeah, to this day, they release cars known as like the Modena, the Marinello, the, um, you know, the Roma is a current yeah. car in their lineup. It's all tied to Italy. Um, Enzo was fiercely Italian. And he was quite a tyrant, to be honest with you. Like he ran that company when he was alive with an iron fist. And it wasn't until it was bought by Fiat that he had to relinquish some control. But part of the deal with Fiat was that, you know, the buck stops with Enzo. Like he made all final decisions. Uh, Fiat was there basically to finance the company and reap the uh, financial rewards from owning it. But yeah. it, the day he died, it was Enzo's company. And oh. um, it clearly, oh. the nature of the company reflected the nature of the man, you know. Without was, a doubt. Yeah, he was uh, a patriot um, and nothing in this world meant anything to him more than his racing and, and his cars, so. Well, I, you know, I can't speak to that or, you know, him as a person, but uh, I can say that uh, they've uh, created some of the finest automobiles the world has ever known. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's really cool. And I think that aspect of Ferrari um, is just, it makes more sense to me now, you know, just mm -hmm. that, that, that pride that goes along with it and those uh, Tifosi that you called the Tifosi. Earlier. Yeah. If you ever have the chance to go to a Formula One race, you'll just see hordes of them dressed in red, kitted out. And uh, most of them have Italian flags draped over their shoulders. And the, and, the, and the interesting thing is it's not just Italians. The Tifosi are sort of a worldwide unofficial mm -hmm. organization of fanatics. And uh, there's really, there's just nothing quite like it. You know, they're, I'm a huge fan of, you know, the Dodgers, the Yankees. I've got my sports teams, but, you know, my Ferrari fandom has always come first. And I'm, I'm on the lesser rungs of the Tifosi ladder. Uh, there are people whose whole house is, is painted with Ferrari murals and flags. Good Lord. Okay. Yeah, it's it's really crazy, and I had the pleasure and uh, was blessed to be able to go to the Ferrari factory in Marinello twice. Wow, in really? Yeah, and I ate at the restaurant uh, right across from the factory gates where Enzo would have lunch and dinner every single night. It's called the Cavallino Restaurant. Um, and the whole, literally the whole town of Marinello is just one big ode to Enzo Ferrari and that company. Like that whole city wouldn't be on the face of the earth were it not uh, for Enzo. Cause when he built his factory there, it was mostly just farmland. And now there's mm -hmm. a whole big town there. Everything is Ferrari related. You see Ferraris driving all over the streets being test driven. Uh, the factory test track, which is known as Fiorano is right there. And one of the two occasions uh, I was in Marinello. We had lunch at the Cavallino and we walked out and I could hear a V10 Formula One engine. And I was like, holy cow, what's going on? I ran back inside and I asked the maitre d'. I said, there's a Formula One car running somewhere. He goes, ah, yes, today at Fiorano, uh, Fernando Alonso is testing the car. That's so awesome. I raced over. Somehow I found this little area where there was a, uh, a wire fence and that's what separated me from the Fiorano test track. And I got to see Fernando Alonso doing laps in a, 
in a V10 Formula One car and there were photographers, you know, paparazzi all around. And it's just magic. There's, there's no place and nothing quite like the mystique of, of Ferrari. That's very cool. That's a, that's a good story, man. Um, yeah. yeah, I, you know, I get it more now. I do. I, I, I've always been a big Ferrari fan, right? Like I'm not, uh, I couldn't name every single model there is, but you know, the models that I do like, I really, I love them. You know, I had posters of them on my wall as a kid. Sure. Um, so I appreciate them. Uh, when you were talking about the company and then, uh, you know, I think we've talked about this a little bit in the past. Um, when you got to the, the Ford versus Ferrari, uh, point, um, mm -hmm. A part of me started thinking, you know, like, and we talked a little bit about this uh, with the NSX as well, you know, mm -hmm. how those relationships were stressed um, and how Enzo would have felt, or was it Enzo? Who was, who was, yeah, it would have been Enzo, right? Mm -hmm. um, how he would have felt dealing with Henry Ford, the second or third? I believe uh, second at the, the time. The second. Um, and, you know, basically like uh, giving over a piece of his, his company, um, mm -hmm to these Americans who we were just fighting, you know, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it makes me think factory. about that. Who no, yeah, who blew exactly, up yeah. factory, no less. Exactly, um, yeah. Yeah, um, I think they managed to put away, you know, that, that was close to uh, World War II. It ended 15, maybe 18 years it's prior. not that long. It's not that long, but I think really the sticking point ended up being Enzo's control uh of the company and i think ford being ford just being a huge american company didn't really understand the man and what he had built and how he had built it uh it, it was like basically you know ford was just a huge company with all these vice presidents and departments and this and that ferrari was Enzo, <laughs> you know, it was like one guy calling every shot. Sure, he had engineers and, you know, uh, designers and so forth. But every decision went through Enzo. There were no vice presidents. There were no anything like that. There were no executives. It was Enzo. And I think during negotiations, Ford just didn't understand completely um, why, like why they should give all this money to buy the company and not control it. And Enzo's answer to everything, you know, when they would say, well, we want to, you know, be able to be involved in the development of, you know, engines of, you know, chassis and so forth. Enzo's answer was just always like, no, I mean, that's what I do. And yeah. so in the end, there was probably no amount of money in the world that was going to convince Enzo Ferrari to sell his company to Ford. Whereas with Fiat, which was run by Italians and was a massive, massive company like Ford is, but they were, they were Italian nationals mostly running Fiat and they understood the legend of, of Enzo, knew where he, who he was and what he stood for. And those negotiations actually succeeded because they knew if they wanted to buy Ferrari, there were just some things that were off the table in negotiations. And, and sure enough, Enzo retained control of all production, design, everything up until the day of his death, of his death in 1980. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, that's, I mean, I it's can't blame the guy, but... Yeah. It, it brings to mind a, a point that you tried to make just a moment ago, Greg, and I disagreed. Um, and that was that, you know, their fans are more fanatical than, you know, um, their American counterparts, right? And I don't think that's true because when you think about uh, Corvette people or, um, you know, uh, uh, Shelby people, right? Um, I think they're, they're right there. And they go back to almost just as far. So... I, I, I mean, know. I'm a I'm a Mopar guy through and through, but like my house isn't painted Mopar blue. There are actually people who paint their homes red for Ferrari. I mean, it, it's a fanaticism. It's not just fandom. It 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 really borders on fanaticism. There there. Are I think our our motorsports don't lend themselves to that, right? Like, so Formula One is not that popular in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. And if it were, and we had, you know, well, okay, I, I don't want to go down that road, but um, 
Formula One is not as popular in the United States, um, but NASCAR is. And I bet you could find someone who painted their house uh, in Dale Earnhardt, you know, yeah, number um, three uh, livery. Yeah. yeah. So could be. Um, my point being just, you know, I've been going to Formula One races since I was nine years old. I've attended 52 of them in my life. And um, there, there are plenty of teams in Formula One that have followings. McLaren has a huge following. Mercedes these days is very popular because they win a lot. But literally without Ferrari in Formula One, there would be no Formula One. Like the whole series would collapse uh, because hundreds of millions of fans would just walk away from the sport. And there was actually a, a couple of times where Enzo threatened to leave Formula One because he didn't like the direction the sport was taking in terms of its new technical rules or something like that. And Formula One, both on both occasions acquiesced to Enzo's demands because they knew Formula One is Ferrari. I mean, you is know. Ferrari the the winningest uh, team yes. of all time? Yes, by far. More so than Mercedes? Yes, by far. Mm. By far. What about in recent years? Uh, well, in recent years, Mercedes uh, had sort of had a head start on the current engine formula, which is a V6 turbo hybrid, which incorporates kinetic energy recovery and turbo heat recovery. And Mercedes were the ones who sort of advocated for this formula back in 2013 or 2012. And they got a kind of a head start on development um, when the engines were first deployed in the cars in 2014. And because of that, uh, Mercedes really had a year or two head start on these engines that really they've only relinquished starting this year. Now Red Bull Racing actually has a faster, more powerful car uh, using a Honda uh, hybrid engine. Um, but Mercedes has dominated the sport since 2014. And to be honest with you, it's been kind of boring because like one year, the two Mercedes drivers won like 16 out of or 17 out of 20 races. I mean, it's just it, Formula One's kind of done a poor job of reining in this level of dominance. I think they should have done so earlier. Um, but, you know, there are plenty of Mercedes fans to which this is, you know, the, the golden era for them. Uh, yeah. I happen not to be one of them. My golden era was when the legendary Michael Schumacher was driving for Ferrari uh, starting in 1996. Uh, it took several years for Schumacher and Ferrari to win the world championship, uh, but they managed to do so in the year 2000 and then proceeded to win every title 2000, 2001, 2002, 3, 4. And those years for me were, was clearly, just clearly this guy Schumacher, right? Um, Nine uh, races he won. So, and how many world your, titles? Seven? Seven world titles, yeah, which has and recently your, been tied by Lewis Hamilton last year for Mercedes. But in your mind, is he, uh, well, okay, so aside from him, who are the Mercedes drivers that stand that you, that you stand out in your mind? Uh, well, Mercedes took a long time. Right, I'm sorry, uh, Ferrari. Sorry. Oh, in terms of Ferrari, well, Michael Schumacher, far and away, was the greatest champion they ever had. But uh, they also more than uh, Mario. Yeah, Mario only won, I'd say, about ten races for Ferrari in total, but won really? the world championship in 1978. Uh, but okay. he won it with Lotus because he had switched over to the, the Lotus team. Mario never oh, okay. won the world championship for Ferrari. But uh, next to Schumacher, uh, Kimi Raikkonen, who just announced his retirement a couple of days ago, he won the last championship for Ferrari, uh, was a great driver. Fernando Alonso, who many of you know because he's raced, he does some racing in Le Mans and IndyCar now in addition to Formula One. Um, uh, he was never won the world championship for Ferrari, but won a bunch of races. Um, 
in the 70s, you had the legendary Nikki Lauda, um, who, if y'all have seen the movie Rush, directed by Ron Howard, uh, he was the Oh, that was a Ron Howard movie? That was good. Yeah. yeah. He won the championship twice for Ferrari in the mid-70s. Um, and then going back further, I mean, you have legendary names. You have Ferrari world champions like Phil Hill, John Surtees, who's the only man ever to win world championships in Formula One and the top series of motorcycles at the time, uh, which I forget what the series was called. It was like 500, I think it was 500 cc racing bikes. It's the equivalent of like uh, today, what's known as uh, MotoGP. Um, And, uh, you know, Alberto Ascari, uh, Juan Manuel Fangio, all these guys that at one point in their career, they were seduced by the legend of Ferrari to drive for Ferrari, you know, and Enzo was very particular. And perhaps one of the most beloved, there was a French uh, Canadian driver named Gilles Villeneuve uh, who drove for for Ferrari in the 70s. In fact, my very first race, which was at Watkins Glen in 1979, the US Grand Prix at Watkins Glen, Villeneuve won in a Ferrari. And that's really where my passion for Ferrari racing started with because Villeneuve was this fabulous guy. He was like really handsome and charming and everybody loved him. And sadly, he died in a Ferrari Formula One car in Belgium in uh, 1982 um, before ever becoming world champion. He, He and he was real young. He was like late 20s, I think, when he died. And uh, he's beloved amongst Tifosi. Enzo kind of adopted Gilles Villeneuve as his son, uh, even though Enzo had biological sons. Um, he loved Villeneuve that much. And uh, Gilles Villeneuve is the father of Jacques Villeneuve, who won the uh, IndyCar title and the Formula One title about 20 years after his father's death. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's some real legendary drivers attached um, to Ferrari, some of the best in history, uh, Schumacher being on everybody's list of like the top five drivers of all time, along with Senna and, and people like that. Man, those are some serious names. I always thought Mario Andretti uh, did more uh, for Ferrari. Uh, he raced for Ferrari quite a bit, but uh, in Formula One, he he only won, I think, like a handful of races um, and only raced in a small amount of races for Ferrari. But where Mario, um, his connection to Ferrari, Mario drove lots of Ferrari sports cars and all kinds of racing like Daytona. Uh, like the endurance races at Daytona and Sebring and Le Mans. Uh, Mario had a very close relationship with Enzo Ferrari personally, um, but most of his Ferrari racing was not in Formula One. It was in other other forms of, uh, of racing. Gotcha. That explains it. Well, what about the Tributo, Rob? Tell us about that car in particular. Actually, should we do it while we're looking at it? Sure. I think, uh, I think everyone, yeah, everyone's been patient long enough. We should dive into it. Yeah. Greg, as you pull that up, did you have any thoughts on, uh, you know, just the history of the company, um, as Rob was talking about, about it? I mean, it it was just, (laughs) the biggest thing was when he said built a factory in 43, I knew it was coming. Yeah. (laughs) Like, you know, they were, they were part of the axis and (laughs) everything, that was yeah. industrial got uh, got flattened so um i i think um, it would be a better story if that was the reason why the whole ford story, <laughs> i mean honestly it would be a better story if he was like who knows I'm, I'm Maybe holding, I'm right. yeah no, i don't think it was i mean no i i the story i've always read and i've read books about it is that enzo just refused to relinquish any sort of formal control over the production of cars and you know Ford just didn't understand they were like what do you mean we're going to buy your company for hundreds of millions of dollars how we're going to control it and Enzo was just like no yeah <laughs> not and, and honestly I don't even know that that's a nationality thing I think that you just found Fiat was willing to put up with his crap 
yeah. to have, you know, for that brand. Like, yeah, pretty much. And, and I'm not trying to say it's crap, but you know, he, he sounds like he would not be fun to work for. No, no. <laughs> he was known as not the nicest man in the world. He wasn't, you know, Machiavelli wrote a book uh, called The Prince. And in The Prince, probably the most famous line, if anybody out there is familiar with The Prince, is uh, Machiavelli wrote, it is better to be feared than loved. And he meant that from a political standpoint, that you have more power if you make your enemies afraid of you, as opposed to make, trying to make everybody love you as a leader. And Enzo was very Machiavellian. He really didn't give a rat's ass what anybody else thought. Um, you know, a decision, like I said, was not made at that company unless it went through him. And that's just the type of man he was. I'm sure he was a complete terror. But people did at the same time, you know, respect him. Um, and on rare occasions, like with Gio Villeneuve, like I told you, he sort of adopted Villeneuve as a, as a son almost. Um, you know, there were occasions where he opened his softer side to people um, and let them in. But most, more often than not, he was pretty tough, pretty tough. Um, so anyway, we were going to uh, discuss the Ferrari F8. Yes, um, that's what I was actually, um, I was, sorry, go ahead, Rob. Well, Ferrari's lineup uh, in recent years, as we look at some clips of the Ferrari Formula One team in some high fashion, um, uh, Ferrari's lineup in recent years has always consisted of about four cars. They always have an entry level model then they have their prime sports car model. Then they have a V12 front engine high end model. And then they always have a hyper car um, like the LaFerrari or the F40 or the Enzo. Um, in addition to that right now, Ferrari has a four wheel drive vehicle, um, a four seater sort of family four wheel drive car with 700 horsepower in it. <laughs> and uh, they are developing an SUV with a terrible name. It's called the Puro Sangue, I think, or something. <laughs> but that's to compete with that Lamborghini uh, SUV that... Uh, uh, Uros or whatever? The uh, Urus. Urus. But um, really, in their lineup, the car that's most important to Ferrari is not the entry level and not the high-end front engine V12. Their bread and butter is their mid-engine sports car, which is always dead center in the middle of the Ferrari lineup. And right now that car is the F8 Tributo. And it has tons of Formula One technology in it, um, is considered to be the most well-balanced in terms of weight distribution uh, car on the planet. And that's what we're going to build. Okay. So they have a configurator. Yep. Um, and do we, we want, want the 2D or the 3D? No, we, we actually want to do photo realism because okay. the 3D is the graphics are kind of crappy. Okay. Oh, so there oh, is man, that's a good looking car. The magnificent Ferrari F8 Tributo. There is nothing on the road that looks quite like it. And we're it. gonna do it in blue, right? Ferrari blue, <laughs> Ferrari dark blue. Well, that's... this time, you know, in the past <laughs> we've like argued back and forth about colors. I'm gonna be like Enzo Ferrari tonight, and I am going to say there is only one color that this car is gonna be built in today, and that's Rosso Corsa, which means race red. Well, because they is, have they have the three reds, right? But that Rosso one? Rosso Corso is the one that dates back to the beginning of Ferrari. That's the color he always raced in, and that Ferraris to this day uh, race in. Rosso Scuderia was a slightly brighter red that was used in the Schumacher era of Formula One. Yeah, um, because their main title sponsor was Marlboro cigarettes yes. and Marlboro wanted to match the color of their logo to the car. So they used Rosso Scuderia. And what's but the Mugello? Like, I mean, eh, they have so eh. many gorgeous cars. 
for this particular car, though, Rosso Corso Red is... Uh, What's this Rosso Fiorino? Fiorano. That's Fiorano. the test track I actually got to see Fernando Alonso racing on at Marinello. Did that not change? I don't think that changed. Uh, it did, slightly. It very subtle. Yeah, oh, it did. Okay. Hey, so I'm looking at this thing. It's obviously, it's just, it's... It's striking, man. It's beautiful. Look at the lines on that thing. Um, yeah. But if you look at the grill, uh, go back to like one of those bright reds, they, Greg. They offer it in British racing green. That blows well, me away. Well, they'll also make a Ferrari in any color you want. If your wife has a favorite shade of lipstick, they'll paint, they'll match that color okay. and paint your car that color. Fair enough. I mean, I see a lot of racing, like they've got Argento Nürburgring. They've got mm -hmm. uh, Grigio Silverstone. Silverstone, Daytona, yeah, uh, Tour Bugatti. de France. Yeah, like it's all racing heritage. Yeah, it's a racing okay. company. So, so there's there's our red. There's all right. So if you look at the grill, it looks kind of like um like a like a snake with sticking <laughs> yep. its tongue out. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. I can see that for sure. <laughs> this That's awesome. The interesting thing about this car, previous models, uh, the mid-engine uh, V8 sports car. Uh, were all designed by the uh, legendary um, uh, design company called Pin and Farina. And just recently, Ferrari stopped having their bodies designed by Pin and Farina, and they designed this car in house. Um, so it's the first true, like, Ferrari design bodywork uh, in quite a long time. And uh, it's magnificent when you see it on the street. There's nothing like it. Greg, if you go down to the bottom, you see that circular? Yes, click that. And we can actually rotate around the car by dragging it from every angle of this car. Good Lord. A sex machine. Am I crazy for picking up a little bit of like Lotus vibe off this? Uh, yes. A little bit, maybe in the taillights, uh, yeah. the round taillights. But, you know, these companies tend to, to borrow little things from one another. But well, and really, also, like we said, when you des you're designing in a wind tunnel, everything's got to kind of... Yeah. Uh, this is heavily wind tunnel driven. But at the same time, I mean, I see them every so often in Beverly Hills and stuff. And everybody stops and turns and looks at this car. It's, it's magnificent. Uh, I, I mean... I don't speak Italian, but Tributo, I, I think I can take a stab at what it means. Yeah, yeah um, it's Tribute, obviously, and the name refers to Enzo Ferrari, Tribute to Enzo. Gotcha. I That's like cool. It. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's beautiful, man. So I Vinny, even like Vinny, the, you going to talk crap about the five-spoke wheels? I, I <laughs> swear to you, Greg, I was literally, I was literally just about to say, I actually like those five spoke wheels. Well, you might like those. They have a wheel selection that we might have to choose that's even prettier than this. And right, if so I was building we... this for myself, I think I would probably opt for uh, this other wheel. All right. So, so we we'll definitely so we're change done with, them. But we're we're done nice. with paint work, right? We're done with yeah, paint. No, okay. You know, you got to yeah. do traditional Ferrari red. Without a doubt. Uh, you don't Oof. do by color. I just want to see it. I, I don't know how you could do it. I, I just. No, uh, I don't. Uh, it might look cool. Let me see it from the side with that black. Let me do this. With the... Don't do it, Vinny. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't. You're right. That looks stupid. It, it's go just you don't do it, it does kind of look sharp. It takes. A, I do oh, think it takes away from the. Hold on. It takes away from the whole car, I think. Ooh. But it does look pretty sharp. They have a spider version of this car, a convertible, and the top is usually black. Um, but oh, on the coupes, better. traditionally, people just do monocolor on Ferraris. Yeah. Coupes. And with, with their carbon fiber engine bay. With their yeah. carbon fiber engine bay, which probably just jacked up the price by about $25,000. But who's counting? Don't care. It's a Ferrari. Who's counting? It's a Ferrari. All right. Can you get carbon wheels on this thing? You cannot get carbon, but... If Ooh, you look at the second silver, row, second row, the silver ones, my man. We have like had this conversation. Ones. I yeah. have a problem with these centers because oh, oh. they're asymmetric. Oh, go that's, back. Go but back. That's Italian, dude. That's awesome. 
go back to the first, uh, sorry, to the, 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 the um, rotating uh, view and just look at it with these wheels on it. That, yeah, that's, that's crazy hot. That's a spicy meatball. I'm, I'm going to have to disagree <laughs> here. I you don't dig those, really? I'm no. Shocked. I know. Well, it's okay. You could be wrong. Let's, but... <laughs> oh, they do have carbon fiber wheels. Oh, that Ooh, must be a new That's addition. the one. I know, Rob, you're going to uh -huh. hate it because they're black, but uh -huh. that, that's what I would pick. Good yep. Lord. Oh. And I, li and I like the wheel design. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, you're right. It's not my thing, but... Uh... Damn, I get why you like that. the silver. You know, it's it's classic. Yeah, uh, I mean, for me, that. building it for my own uh, would be a silver wheel, which is the classic. Yeah. It's for sure classic Ferrari. Um, uh, but this, well, now, if, now, you guys gave me you guys gave me Rosso Corso red. So if you want carbon fiber wheels, you can have it. But right? Rob, well, you would, so you would pick? Okay, let's look at just top row. Okay, would you not pick row, I one would, of the gun medals? Uh, yes, I would probably okay. go for the third, the Grigio, which means gray in Italian. If let's I was going with that wheel, I would probably go gray. Let's just look at it. silver. Yeah. See, I, I just, oh, that's cool. I, I almost like, the darker like that gray. more than the carbon. No, almost. I said almost, but I think the, the carbon definitely. Great. Wins. Yeah, you I just mean, want a non asymmetrical wheel and and you're no it's just that's so cool you wait you love carbon i just said that wins i said i said the the uh standard matte grigio corsa rims come close and why are we calling them rims ferrari well yeah they shouldn't be doing that to be honest but that'll start uh, I, you can't, come on you can't go wrong with any of these wheels i mean these are yeah. you know four thousand dollar a piece wheels before well, I, you get into carbon fiber i'm sure the I carbon mean, fiber ones are six or seven thousand a wheel so but let's be honest these aren't, get... these aren't carbon fiber these are carbon fibre fibre that is true when these are should... carbon fibre so that's an extra thank you thousand buddy wheel. for making that distinction that's that an if, that's if, a thousand wheel extra right there if i could get that middle row in carbon that's the wheel hmm yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd take the silver uh, asymmetrics personally. But, you know, even the silver standard rims are, to me, gorgeous. I know yeah. you don't like five spokes, Vinny, but... No, I, I actually like the, that wheel. It's yeah, not the I one mean, I would pick out of these selections. You can't... There's no ugly wheel here. So if you guys want to go carbon, I'm good with it. I like the carbon. All mm -hmm. right. Slap a red Brembo on there. Gotta be You'd red. You'd go red? I mean, I'm Hell surprised. Yeah. Who would choose the blue? I mean, like, let, let's just look at it. Let's give it a fair shake. Well, let's, it's not so, on a, not but, on a red car, but maybe on a blue car. On a blue car, you still need red calipers. Silver. I, I'm Try with the silver, you, bud. I'm totally with you, but uh, no. Yeah, yellow. I, that, maybe that looks unfinished to me. Yeah. I think yellow. Yeah, mate. No, it's got to be red. Well, let's see what the yellow looks like. From the side, I, I I'm not. I don't. It's gonna think look gonna like a it. Ronald McDonald car. Yeah, exactly. Well, it matches the Ferrari logos. Mm -hmm. There's always yellow. Oh yeah. Ferrari. But I, I don't, that, I the don't shield think. on the fender makes yeah. it match. But then, then we go to red, and I mean, it's just. I think. I think that's a no-brainer, especially with the carbon wheels. Yeah. Really, with oh, any yeah. wheels, Ooh. even the silver Ooh. wheels, the red is is the ticket. <laughs> well that's like when i was having that conversation down at bear with with uh rick and 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 how and yeah. i was like you know they make every color any color you could want no, and i'm like they, don't. <laughs> they I'm like, just there's only one color that matters exactly and, the, let me ask you something greg have you noticed that recently all car companies that use brembo brand uh, calipers and and rotors have you noticed that car companies are now almost universally putting their own name on Brembo brakes. Whereas in the past, like my challenger had Brembo red caliper brakes. If I were to buy a Hellcat today, it says SRT, I believe on the brakes. Well, yes, yes. And no, because there's a certain company where the four piston brakes are Brembo's. Mm -hmm. They, but they are not the premium option. 
Mm. Therefore, they say nothing. Ah, oh, that's it. Even, even though it's a Brembo. Well, the Hellcats have six piston Brembos, mm -hmm. but they do say SRT on it. And I noticed on this F8, it says Ferrari on it instead of Brembo. Yeah. So. And, and if you think about it, like the CTSV mm -hmm. did it. Same thing. Yeah. Um, the Saw one on the road today, you guys. Did yeah. you? Yeah, it's a sweet car. Did you go smoke it just because you were like... <laughs> hey, so listen we, to my new noises guy <laughs> we were driving next to each other for sure and um i'm sure he saw my uh my whipple license plate frame on the camaro but um well, you need to tell everybody what we're referring to because not everybody out there watching that's true um, yeah the article um, hasn't got the article yeah, hasn't it hasn't gone, gone live no it hasn't but uh i was planning on referencing it in the intro uh to this episode uh that we shoot at a later time but if you want to jump the gun, Rob, we can talk about it right now. <laughs> I uh, think I gotta... we should, because I'm very excited about this. And I know <laughs> you are. So, so go ahead. In a nutshell. For everybody, yeah, everybody watching at home, Rob's talking about uh, one of the projects on Street Muscle Magazine. It's called the Daily Camaro. If you're not familiar, go check it out right now. Uh, it's a 2010 Camaro SS RS that we've been kind of working on uh, with the idea in mind that it would serve as the daily driver. Um, well, we recently supercharged it. We took it down to Whipple Superchargers here in Fresno, California, slapped a 50 state legal uh, 2.9 liter supercharger on it. And then I drove about five hours home uh, a few days later, um, AC full blast and, uh, you know, that supercharger screaming. I won't divulge the, the power numbers just yet. You'll have to read the article for that. But let's just say it's a handful. It's a handful, but you, you've you got it tuned on the conservative side, let's admit, in terms of boost and stuff. And yeah, maybe there's, maybe there's future articles and videos about turning up the, the boost a little bit in the future. You know, I really I, think we could we could stand to build an LS3 short block in engine labs. I'm just saying. Like, yeah. uh, you know what, you guys? I'm just right now I'm having fun uh, testing it. Uh, oh, and it's great. it's current configuration. And uh, so I don't know, maybe we'll see. Uh, but for now, we're going to keep that pulley on there. And uh, I think it's <laughs> I think it's on the uh, on the top end. It's making like nine pounds of boost. Nice. Um, so nice just, and healthy. Just, just remember yeah. this, Vinny. It's always easier to swap out short blocks when you're pulling out one complete one and putting a new complete one in. Mm. as opposed to doing it after maybe you have hurt one i'm just saying let's so that's not ahead. gonna happen but uh you know i'm i'm not uh in the practice of um putting stuff like that into the universe greg i think this thing's gonna live a long and healthy life and as long uh, as you don't get greedy i mean honestly that's that's 100 percent true you leave it as it left as it rolled out a whipple it'll it'll live forever mm. well um you know i don't <laughs> you know, if, if so, the whole point of uh, that project was to create something that some the average enthusiast could afford to buy, right? So, a 2010 Camaro is a pretty old car by today's, uh, like you know, I mean, if you're comparing it to like the most modern uh, Camaro, right? So, it's been out for a while, and then uh, you know, modify it in a way that's legal. Um, so, we did you know some bolt-on parts and stuff like that, but save for the blower uh, and some headers and uh, exhaust it's pretty much bone stock right um and uh yeah so i don't you know i don't have any designs on making like a thousand wheel horsepower or anything that's not the point of of that project yeah well doing he says so. now let's record this <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's record this right now because you no know, i said <laughs> i there, there are so many other cars i would be able to do that um, i know i know it just yeah no, that, addictive and well yeah without for sure you know everything but I have is a, slow two yeah, weeks later yeah i have a 68 firebird that you know i would like to put a thousand horsepower engine in before i did it to this camaro you know what i mean i got you well so. for daily driving sake also when you start really pushing boost you you know you obviously give up in, a lot in terms of reliability and and the overall endurance of the of the powertrain and um exactly so well how many, how many bolts hold on that pulley 
More boost is just three bolts away, right? Three bolts yeah. on the pulley. I'm not a good influence. Greg and I have you not Greg, learned this? I'm not a good influence. Y'all ever see Animal House in the scene yeah. where where the guy's got the girl passed out in his dorm room and she's naked and a devil appears on one <laughs> shoulder and says, You shouldn't touch her, it wouldn't be right. And then or, or the angel says that, and then the devil is like. Give it to her, man. Give it to her. Greg, <laughs> Greg is the devil, and yeah, and and yeah. Vinny is the angel on his own shoulder. So. Maybe I, you know, I mean, uh, that that's why I stress that point. Um, that you know, I, I had the AC blown full blast. It was like a hundred degrees driving through the valley, and the thing ran fantastic. You know, so I don't have any plans on messing with it. The thing's amazing. It makes more than enough horsepower. Again, read the article when it comes out to find out what that number is um and i'm very happy with it shout out to whipple back to the ferrari yeah well <laughs> congratulations and back to this ferrari i thought i'd note at this point since we were rotating uh if you notice the shape of this car all the ducting in fact above the headlights there's small ducks yeah right there um, this is, you know, when we were talking briefly before about aerodynamics, this car incorporates tricks learned in Formula One in terms of ducting air uh, and then releasing it at other points in the car to generate downforce. Um, like right here, I would love to know why the frunk is ducted. Well, the radiator, your... the radiator oh. is, is up there. And so you got an intake and then the hood is the uh, for the air to pass through the radiator and out. Okay, so it's it's not a frunk. Correct. Okay. Um, but I mean, this car, it's amazing that they designed something this gorgeous while putting an emphasis on aerodynamics. Because I think these days, you know, a lot of the time, like with the NSX, for example, we noted how the shape, it wasn't an ugly car, but it was clearly you know, functionally designed. Whereas this, I mean, this is functionally designed, but it's still one of the best looking cars on the planet and generates a, an S ton of downforce. There's, and that all- There's uh, some human uh, aspect to the yes, design here. There's a lot of sex and passion in this. With I, the cars when hit. I look at it, I really think like, I see it a snake um yeah you know, it's like it's a just, black mamba it's it's co a coiled snake ready to yeah the, the eye and then the wide mouth yeah yeah, yeah man absolutely. it's just it's like this you know it's our dead de it's a deadly animal man it's beautiful it's, uh and really, i know some people are freaked out by snakes but i think they're gorgeous yeah. it's it's automotive art and that's what ferrari pursues in all their models but i think the fa tributo here they really they really nailed it. This is one of the prettiest cars to come out of Ferrari in a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. For I, sure. I, so the 458 Italia used to be my favorite. Um, and I think this one is now my favorite. Yeah. Well, the 458, this car is two generations removed from the 458, but is based on the same overall shape. Uh, the drivetrain has been changed significantly since the 458. But if you look at the two, the profiles of the two cars are quite similar. Um, it's the detailing and surface uh, creases and curves that have changed. And I agree with you. I mean, this is a prettier car than the 458. So next up, you get to, whoops, wait. No, why do you oh, okay. I was going to say, y'all get to spend a lot of money on carbon fiber right now. Yep. Air dam, rear diffuser, everything. The vents on the um, on Wait, the so turbo. you can you can either select carbon or you can't, but you can't like piecemeal it. No, it's because Ferrari package. has decided what you will and will not get. Correct. Yeah. Well, that's all right. So you got all the ducting that's carbon now. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Plus the entire rear diffuser. There's a lot of carbon back there. And the entire front uh, bumper intakes. What is yeah. uh, I know? So we're not going to have pricing on this build, right? Um, we'll have a base price, but no, we don't. Uh, yeah, so we don't price. know how much the options cost. Oh, I'd say that's a good fifty thousand dollars worth of Italian carbon fiber, right there. Yeah, maybe forty thousand, but it's it's big numbers. Not to mention the wheels. Yeah. yeah. So let's go to exhaust pipes. 
Yeah, yeah. So your standard. Tor- standard. I dig the titanium. Mm-hmm. Lightweight. And what does sport do? Um, it's black. black. No, it's it's not. It's not really. Yeah. Because I'd go titanium over black any day of the week. Same here. Yeah. I don't titanium. hate the black with the with the black wheel or with the carbon wheels, but the titanium looks cool. I'd go titanium. It's very lightweight um, and looks great. Yeah. And it turn will it turn purple over time? I doubt it. No, that's Ferrari. you have to. And well, you could anodize it. You get under there with a twelve volt battery and and uh, some salt water. No, but like you know, when they get so hot, it's like annealing, and it turns like you know what I mean. Yeah. I don't. I don't think you get it hot enough to anneal it. Like no. No, yeah, titanium, no I, I know what you're talking about. Titanium is a, a property um, that it's extremely heat resistant. In fact, the entire uh, fuselage of the SR-71 Blackbird was made out of titanium because it was the only material that could stand up to the friction of flying at uh, Mach 3. Mach, plus. Yeah. yeah. So next up, interior. Now, here's a choice I'm going to throw at you. Ferrari standardizes it in black, but traditionally, back in the 60s and 70s, the traditional color scheme was Rosso Corsa red on the outside and a beige on the inside, like Cuyo right there that you had your cursor. Yeah, that would be the traditional color. But notice... There are still, uh, we built another car where, I guess it was the NSX where we were pissed. The stitching, yeah. It, it doesn't cover the entire interior in tan. Um, there's still black areas. Uh, on uh, this car, so like normally I would be with the tan, like red on tan, like you're saying, Rob, fantastic. But since we selected the carbon wheels. You go black. Uh, yeah, I would go black. Yeah, I I would probably option black in my own Ferrari to be so honest. You guys really don't like the red? It's cool, but I think that's too much red. The outside's red. This is red. Nah. Calipers are red. It's a lot of red. I, I, I agree with Vinny. I think I would just go black. But uh, I know a f- lot of Ferrari traditionalists would say. Can I get a different uh, pattern seat, though? Yes. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care for that pattern. Seats. Yes, we've got the Daytona. I like those. Those are from the Daytona model of the early 70s that had that style of seat. We've got the diamond pattern. I am Mm -hmm. a fan of that. My current seat that I'm sitting in has the diamond pattern. Mm -hmm. I dig diamond, but not on this car. I I agree with you there. I don't think it fits this car. There's the style seats, which I kind of like because they've got perforated, right? Uh, It's It's like ventilated, yeah, for cooling. It's too like Tron. Then they've got the standard racing carbon seats. Oh. These are a little much for me. Not gonna lie, little, yeah. it's a little, little much. wild, yeah. little. And then the Daytona racing carbon seats, which again are the same seats but with a weird insert. I'm I a like Daytona the- fan personally. Yeah, I, I like. Yep, the this standard, one? the standard the Daytona. Yeah, yeah, that's my jam. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. good to go right there. All right, so that's easy enough interior details they have one of the greatest options <gasps> here okay well obviously okay wait before you click it <laughs> i already did too late did it you'll notice not only is the steering wheel all in carbon fiber but if you look oh. at the top part of the wheel mm-hmm. it has leds incorporated in that as a rev counter which yes. is straight out of formula one all formula one cars have that am i mistaken or did it change like Every the layout too, yeah, I can like change. the vents and everything. No, it's, no. Okay, it's just, you're, seeing, right. you're seeing right here. It just looks a little different, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, so I also want to note that this is the very first vehicle that we've done that not only like that allowed this level of customization on the interior dash, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. you can pick a different gauge, which no one else offered. Mm-hmm. I it might be trivial, but. I, the only color I would consider switching it to is maybe white, but I think black isn't a bad starting point, to be honest. See, I, I I've got a thing. I, I like yellow face watches. I have a couple yellow face watches. Yellow looks great, too, because you got the the uh, Cavallino 
logo mm-hmm. on the steering wheel that it matches right there. Like, I just, I'm curious as to this. Like, what the, I, I eh, no. I don't hate it. That's cool, but I like the yellow. The aluminum might be kind of cool in person, but it doesn't really stand out. I do like the yellow, though. So let's go for yellow. Okay. And we have to select the passenger display, which on the dashboard gives you an LED what? readout with speed, G forces, R- <laughs> RPMs. That's so when probably, you're reaching for the oh shit handle, you can see like at what G exactly what G you're being tormented with. And that's yeah. probably a ten thousand dollar option, but for me is a must have. Oh, I thought it was gonna do a 360 interior. Um, I think there is a three here. Click on the little seat next to the road. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Oh wow. <laughs> Yeah, the oh. nicest interior in the business. I, I give this an, a nod over the McLaren, to be honest. I I mean, other than the seats? I really liked the McLaren. I, I mean, I did too, but I... I... Look at the pedals. I like Maybe. this. This, to, to me, seems Spartan compared to the McLaren. The, the I McLaren itself was Spartan. Yeah, the McLaren was more Spartan because, you know, there were less uh, knobs and stuff on it. It was... uh, Yeah, but there was more um, like... uh, Okay, maybe not Spartan. Um, And and this will only uh, bolster your your argument as to why you like it, I think. Um, It's old. Uh, so McLaren, you would say like no, old no, no. This is old school, like not um, modern. Yes, and the McLaren was modern, very modern. Mm. Uh, so I think maybe that's why. But I'm I'm, I'm not going to lie. Without getting too much into what we're going to talk about, I don't know that one takes away from the other. That's mm. what I. That's what I mean. You know, like that's not a knock on the Ferrari, right? Like this is classic. Like um, I'm not going to lie. This little uh, right here, the the climate control that I'm circling. I feel like that's out of place. It's too modern. Yeah. It's too yeah. modern. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? Like the only modern things, like the, the steering wheel, modern, sure. Uh, but if you actually just, like if you didn't know that that digital um, LED display that you were talking about, Rob, mm-hmm. uh, if you didn't know that was there, you would think like that's a, like an older steering wheel. And then it, the the dash display for the passenger seems like they had this classic interior that they've been doing for a long time and then they just added that on mm. you know what i mean uh yeah i hear what you're saying i just don't agree with it um i've sat <laughs> in these cars and, that's fair no i mean i've just sat in them and just the smell alone of the leather and stuff is so intoxicating and you're just literally like that you're was the uncured to, carbon fiber that was you're nasty. you're afraid to touch anything because it's just so clean and pretty and you don't want to leave fingerprints on your steering wheel. I mean, it's just it's an experience sitting in this car. Um, I, I'm not knocking it. I think it, I'm I would feel that you know if I sat in the car, 100% what you're saying. I'm just saying it's it's different. Um, and if I I kind of like the McLaren. A little bit more but it wouldn't be at home on this car right like if they tried to do the same thing mm. it, it wouldn't work because that's not ferrari ferrari is classic there's heritage there and they they accomplished what what they were trying to do with this i just think that um some of this stuff to me seems a little bit out of place but that's mm. not necessarily a bad thing mm. i think the attention to the controls on you know the design of the controls on the steering wheel are directly out of formula one there's oh absolutely no without a doubt like the anodized red switch on the lower right side Mm -hmm. that is what's called manatino and it's an uh anodized red aluminum switch that selects sport modes and um you know throttle modes and 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 uh transmission modes uh it, that's it, what i, I mean, mean that's, like that's i mean straight out of formula without one. a doubt this is definitely the most f1 steering wheel out of all yeah and, well, and just, so that's just to that's see my point, right? like it's a knob like it's an actual knob and i but, get that it's it comes from formula one but like none of the other competitors would have something like that because yeah. it's all touchscreen or you know what i mean right. 
and the LEDs on the steering wheel to yeah. see those light up with revs would just be Christmas to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you can buy that, right? Like after, after yeah, market. but I mean, this is, I'm just saying for, for yeah. maybe, maybe, you know, no, it, Rob, we're not bashing your Ferrari. I'm no, just pointing things out. <laughs> I get it. I like get it. I, my whole point is we can, we can get you this without getting your Ferrari. Like I'm just saying, no. right? like, we can put this in, your, in your car. In that, yeah, in that new Hellcat, dude. We will put new it in Hellcat. Yeah, yeah. We we um, can do this. I've had it. I had it in my road race car. I had two different ones, and I yeah. love them. They're amazing. Yeah. Rob, at the risk of uh, of um, getting you canceled by our our uh, animal loving audience, tell us what you know about Italian leather and why it's important. Uh, it's merino leather. It's um, the most supple, uh, finest leather in the world. They um, they probably throw away more of the leather that they buy than they actually use on the cars because they scan it. Uh, I saw an episode of how things are made on. I think it's on. Uh, was it National Geographic? Uh, Science Channel. Yeah, yes. and they built a Ferrari where they scanned the leather for imperfections, and they will literally throw out a whole sheet of leather if they can't get a perfect piece that, to cover a seat or to cover the dashboard. That's the level of you know attention they pay to refinement and perfection in these cars. All the stitching is done by hand with a sewing needle. It was pretty remarkable. Watching. That's crazy. That yeah, blows that my was, mind. It's that, just that was their dream car lineup. It was the yeah. how it's made dream car. Yeah. So yeah. Um, another thing that I, I I'm not sure a lot of people know about Italian leather uh, in particular, not just the Italian leather that Ferrari uses, but Italian leather is that um, the cat. The reason Italian leather is so uh, revered is because it, it's it's typically or it typically has a lot less imperfections than, or than you know, uh, leather that you would buy here in the United States. And that's because of the way that um, their cattle ranches are run. They don't have uh, barbed wire. No yeah, they don't have barbed. Exactly. They don't have barbed wire and they don't have the same fences that we use here in the United States uh, that, you know, cows could potentially rub up against, scar themselves, and then ultimately show up on the leather. Uh, mm -hmm. They're, I, I guess, free range, maybe you could call it. Um, and so that's why it's so supple and free of imperfections. And now and at the having... risk of pissing someone off, I bet it's also delicious. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. I've, I, I was. <laughs> oh God. What do you say? Having... Like you don't need hamburgers. <laughs> having uh, now yo, alienated every vegan and fan. I, and... I feel attacked and I want to go on record with my audience and let them know I like medium rare steak and Greg is being a little bit sensitive. <laughs> oh i oh yeah okay so you weren't you weren't there at the korean barbecue place to make fun of me and how i cooked my steak so i thought that's what was coming but <laughs> did you get well done i left mine on the grill quite a bit longer than everybody else but yeah wow that's a sin it was delicious still it was amazing oh i'm sure i'm sure it was just I yeah how long did it take you to chew a piece Oh, it took me way longer to cook it than to chew it. <laughs> it was still, it was still melt in your mouth. I mean, it was awesome. Greg, it just everybody else was this... done eating, and my my cubes of steak were still cooking. The foundation of our friendship is now shaken. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gentlemen. having alienated everybody in our audience, <laughs> we can now go on the carpets, and I would say you got to get the F eight logo carpet. Aren't you just going to get the dealer to throw them in, Rob? Uh, isn't, isn't that, that's isn't what that i usually line? say but at ferrari i don't think there are throw-ins those, those are probably two thousand dollar floor mats but they would put on a white glove and slap you the, yeah. the throw-ins at the ferrari dealership is the bottle of water they give you while you're going through your yeah your credit you ask, check and they let you breathe their air you ask, you ask them for, you ask them for a freebie and they ask you to leave. <laughs> yeah, they would spit they would spit on the floor and tell you to get out. Like, yeah, that's wrong. We didn't charge you for the air you're breathing. There's your free. Yeah. What? There's your free. What? So <laughs> I mean obviously black and black. with the logos. Yeah. Yes, okay, so that was easy. All right. So the summary. Oh, oh, that's a cool freaking Ooh. car, man. Yep. Good that's lord. Pretty much my, right now, my 
ultimate price is no object dream car. Look at the, the engine, it's a twin turbo V8, puts out 700 and Greg's gonna have to look it up, but I think yeah. 789 horsepower. The car weighs nothing. Oh, that is a gorgeous car. It's just, God, there are some things in life where you say to yourself, oh man, you know, if you're into watches that that ultimate Rolex or Vacheron Constantine, for me, it's cars. And for me, it's this car. This is what I would get. If I if I had this kind, this kind of money to buy this kind of car, I would also have an Omega. Yeah. Really? An Omega, between uh, Rolex and Omega, you're an Omega, Omega guy? Omega went to the moon, man. Like, no, don't, don't laugh at Omegas. They are nothing wrong with I'm not high quality. I'm not laughing at them. I just, if I look at, um, you know, uh, a, you know Submar- a Submariner and then I look at um, the Omega equivalent, it's just not as good looking to me. I, I don't I, like their design cues. I hate to say this because I know it'll piss people off but I feel like Rolex has almost become a parody of itself. Not, not in their production quality, not anything they're doing just in what a Rolex is. Right. Mm. You know, well, it's, you know, when I was talking earlier about aspirational brands and I said how Ferrari is like the ultimate aspirational brand, it belongs in that family of, of brands like Rolex where, um, like what you're saying, how it's become a parody of itself, it, 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 it's in the sense that uh, people would pay ridiculous amounts of money to aspire to it. And there's the materialistic side of that that you can be critical of. But then there's also the side of it, just like with Ferrari, where you're getting your money's worth. You know, when you buy a Rolex, it is the finest uh internals you know that you can buy um for a quartz watch you know a um, self-winding quartz watch um naturally a timex with a battery in it will tell better time than a rolex but it doesn't have the history craftsmanship performance and that's i mean what you're talking about ferrari as well for for the layman, you're right, Greg, you know, for people who don't know anything about watches, yeah, you know, it's it's kind of like, oh, it's just that status symbol or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the whole reason for owning one. But, uh, you know, that's because they don't know the history, right? Like, um, mm-hmm. Rolex didn't start out as like this luxury watch brand. It started out as a, a, a watch for explorers. And, you know, Jacques Cousteau wore a Rolex, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? The, the yeah. first man to climb Everest wore mm-hmm. a Rolex. No, uh, I, I totally get it. But I, I still like the mystique of the Omega that is was on the moon. You know, oh, I, without I, a doubt. Like, I dig that. Yeah, there's no cool. question. There's but I mean, the truth brand. be told, you know, like, let, let's be realistic. If I was using money out of my own bank account to buy any real badass watch, it would be the discontinued Seiko. Uh, what was the, you know, which one I'm talking about? It's the diver. The one that's like a thousand, a thousand feet rated. It's the real simple yeah, one. It's no. only like 350 bolt well, was only like 350 bucks when it was in production. I don't know. Yeah. Mine goes to 200 meters. I have a Seiko. I'm a, I'm a Seiko guy. I have yeah. a lot of Seiko. No, watches. I mean, but I, I honestly think that, but the what the one I'm thinking of, it, it was discontinued the past few years. Um, but it, it's like, like a legit deep dive deal. The sea, I think it's the sea turtle. That's Something the nickname like that. for it. Yeah. And it's, I think it's got the helium valve on it. And like, yeah. And then I've always wanted to own a know, watch that has a helium valve. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. That, and you can get them on Amazon for like a hundred bucks. There, there's, a, about- there's a Breitling watch where it's got a, um, it's got a button on it that yes. you twist off and you pull this thing out of it and it sends a signal to the- a satellite that you're lost uh, yeah. on a mountain. And if you screw with it and activate it and you're not really in mortal danger, they'll arrest you and fine you like they, thousands of dollars yeah, i read it, about this it transmits on the guard frequency and when you buy it it actually comes with a it's basically a faraday cage so that you can test it right it will tell you it's transmitting the signal but it won't actually transmit the signal out of the faraday yeah, cage. i mean it's crazy they're a wonderful one i mean i've always wanted a tag hoyer uh, monaco like steve McQueen. yeah steve tag. mcqueen's <laughs> fantastic watch. I've, I've always wanted the tag blue angel one and yep, that's just angel. because 
yeah. I used to drive, well, drive right in my, you know, my child seat, uh, past a, a billboard for it every single day on the way to school. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and it, they're only like a $700 watch. Like they're in right. the grant, in the watch scheme of things, they're not that expensive. Right. I think but, uh, it, to, to bring it back to the, uh, the, F8. You know, the, the car yeah. conversation. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, you know, we talk about these brands and there are, you know, everything that we mentioned they're you know they're great they're great brands they make a great product um and there's varying tiers right like so i mentioned you know i i i don't collect them but i have a few seikos right so that that would be like our corvette that we built the the first time right and you're putting that up against like a rolex or a breitling and that's what we're building here today um 110 percent. that's 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 an amazingly fair comparison Mm-hmm. Um, yeah and and you know there are just brands people want to do better in their lives to achieve and it's not it's not a materialistic thing it's like for me the idea of one day owning a ferrari which is such a rare thing that's hand built that's built in the same factory as all the others were built that has this racing heritage which has the heritage of Enzo Ferrari, the man in it. Um, it it's not a um, it's not a you know a vapid thing to me. It, it no. would be owning a piece of history in in respect, like owning a well. A, that's the thing a, for you, Van Gogh or a Picasso. Or, you have you have to remember for you because you appreciate it. I'm sure eighty percent of the people in California that own this car. Don't give two craps about anything. I wouldn't go so far as to 80%, but I would say you're right. The majority are just buying it because it's a Ferrari and they're Jay-Z and they want to be seen. Well, And and that's the problem because because the majority does that. That's the whole, you know. I don't see that that as a problem. Like just like that Rolex that you're talking about, Greg, like, oh, it's become a parody of itself. I don't think so, you know, for those people, but there are the the people that really love it too, right? Like the, like Rob, he loves this car. Yeah. Um, you know, so I don't think it cheapens it. It just, you know, you know who you're, that's a case by case because you know who that person is and you know who this person is. Well, you know what I mean? Sure, for sure. I mean, like, let's, let's, we can even go back to knives, right? Like I have my actual Emerson and I have my knockoff Kershaw Emerson, not knockoff, yeah. a, you know? Yeah, and, licensed. Yeah, licensed. One's a $30 knife and one's a $260 knife. Yeah. There are valid differences. They both cut the, things. They both do, but they are completely different quality of, of item. Of course. Um, and yeah, you know what? For some people, an Emerson is, is a status symbol. Yeah. Just okay. Like so for people who are, a, yeah, I, I guess I see your point, right? Like, so collectors would look at one, you know, and be like, ew, you know, and then they would look at the real one and they'd be like, that's the stuff. Yeah, and it's like, you know, I like the cheap one because when I forget to take it out of my pocket when I'm going to the airport and TSA takes it, I'm not upset because I'm out a $30 knife that does 80% of what I needed to do. I want to throw away $30. uh, For me, owning this car would be a special occasion um, car. Uh, Truth be told, Ferrari drivers do not put a lot of miles on their car for one reason, Um, It's very expensive to service and maintain these cars. In many models, you have to drop the entire engine just to do an oil change, stuff like that. But the other reason is that Ferrari is one of the few cars, few things in the world um, where a modern edition of it in very short time can be worth more money used than it was new. Ferraris appreciate very rapidly and the cars that fetch big money in the future, you know, in 10 years are going to be the ones that have only got like a thousand miles on it. But for me, it would be, you know, a special occasion car, because if you spoil yourself and you drive this daily, and I'm sure there are people out there, they might be in the minority, but there are people out there that drive Ferraris as a daily driver. It would, for me, lose some of its specialness. It's like, Vinny, when you test a high-performance car for the magazine, you know, like a super high-performance car, very expensive, like out-of-your-league type thing, 
And then you go home to your daily, you know, in your daily driver, you go home, um, you notice the differences between what you just drove on the track versus your own car. And if you drove this car every day, I think you would lose some of that sense of specialness. Some um, of the awe. Yeah, some of the awe, which a car like this should always keep its awe. This, they'll and only make several hundred of these this year uh, in total. And you're definitely, you're, you're hitting on a point, uh, Rob, that I think a lot of people um, don't appreciate because it's always going to be like, oh, woe is me. I have a Ferrari, right? Like, uh, but I was listening to this podcast um, with uh, Instagram's number one playboy, Dan Bilzerian. And, uh, <laughs> and he was talking about how... Um, you know, people always say like money can't buy happiness. Uh, but, you know, his contention was that that's not really the case. It's just that your appetite for happiness um, grows. And then also uh, your your tolerance for it um, is, you know, it also grows. Right. So like it's like you a know, drug habit. Yeah. yeah. So the more money you, know, you have, the more refined your taste towards awe is like i could right. be very happy right now in my station of life with a hellcat to and to some people that's an extravagance but then you know if your station in life was at a higher echelon you know that hellcat would suddenly become de classe compared to like this car exactly my news making yeah and it's true but for me you know this is this is hallowed for me, this is a very, very special thing. This is, you know, if you are able to own this, you are in very, very rare company and I would want to keep it holy and hallowed. And I would probably drive it fairly infrequently, but I'll tell you what, I wouldn't look stupid driving it. And some guys do. And I live in an area where you go to Beverly Hills and there's, you know, going back to what Greg said about being a parody, the parody in Beverly Hills is a 70 year old bald guy driving this car or a spider convertible version of this car with like a 20 year old model in the passenger seat. And you just look at it and, you know, he's got the gold Daytona Rolex or whatever. And you're just like, oh, this is just such a tacky, offensive uh, attempt to flaunt wealth. Um, this thing in my hands, it would be on a track under controlled circumstances, and I would push this thing. I, I don't know yeah. if I could do that. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I don't look know if, if you're rich enough to afford it, you're rich enough to afford the insurance, which means you're <laughs> rich enough to be able to risk having to replace it. You know, I, I just Part of me, you know, that story that you told, Rob, like, I agree with you. And I think most people feel that way when they see that happening. But at the same time, I think I would love to have a gold uh, Daytona Rolex. And I, you know what I mean? And and be in that situation, right? Um, it wouldn't be bad. You know, you got a pretty girl with you and a bright red Ferrari. And, you know, you might look like a, like a D-bag to everyone else, but he's right, probably right. having a good time. But I'm saying I wouldn't because I you would be able to tell how much I appreciate this from a historical standpoint. For me, this wouldn't be an excess, like flaunting my wealth. In fact, Understood. Um, just the opposite. This would be me attaining my dream uh, because this car is so important to me. And that would reflect, you know. But to be 100% fair and to play devil's advocate, um. For all we know, that 70 year old with the Daytona on his wrist and the he could the model, feel the same way. That's his that you know what I mean? I'm just saying yeah, that's all know, I, yeah, that's we're, make, we're making we're making a lot it. of judgments here. And I, I know and, we're making generalizations, yeah. but I'd still be wearing this crappy t-shirt while I drove this thing. Yeah, I mean, know, honestly, yeah. I would like to think that if I was ever in that kind of money on the daily, I would still be driving my 2020 Mustang with my atomic G Shock with my Emerson and my, you know. Well, I, you, you would not. You would I, I, not. well I, I'm not sure of any. I think Blazarian had a point, but equally, you know, the cars I own, I, I 
that I care about that aren't like my daily driver, I, I buy them with the notion that I'm going to keep them forever. You know, I'm, I've got a burgeoning car collection and the one, the cars I have selected are cars that have special meaning to me and will remain in my possession until I shuffle off this mortal coil. And, um, for me, that's that's what this is all about. And I think I, but I think I could still be just as happy with my challenger, you know, even if I suddenly found myself a multi, multi, multi millionaire. I'm not sure everybody's tastes. You know, I don't know, man, because then you could just go buy a, a, a demon or a, dude, you know what I mean? Let's be honest. If I was a millionaire, I wouldn't have a million dollar car. I would have 20 shit boxes. <laughs> I mean, well, I no, be sitting, I, if I was a multi multi millionaire, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys and building a car. <laughs> so maybe we yeah. should get back to. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, like, I, I, I think it would be a fun case study to see what I would become with a lot of money. Isn't it interesting? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's give Greg a bunch of money. Yeah, so we can come on, that. let's do it. <laughs> Isn't it saying. interesting though how this particular car? I'm thinking about this now, reflecting on it. How this particular car has launched us into a philosophical discussion of what it is to own it. Yeah. No other car that we've reviewed. We didn't talk about this with the Corvette or the Audi or the NSX or even really the McLaren. There's something about the mystique of Ferrari that like made us ponder like the more philosophical aspects of owning it and what it means to you and stuff like that. And I'd venture to say that's part of the, the myth and the power of the brand, you know? Well, yeah, especially when I just looked up the base point. price. Oh boy, here we go. No, it's not. Yeah. Oh boy. Like 1.2, how much? This says eight hundred. The base 700. price is no, two hundred no, no. eighty. Yeah, but that's that's you know with nothing. But but wait uh, a minute, what? wait a minute. We're we're in really? McLaren territory. I was expecting this thing to be two and a half times that. No, yeah, I was expecting I, at least. I, was I mean, aware. look, you, the the high end model, as I said before, there are four basic uh, models at any given time. Uh, plus a hypercar with Ferrari. The base model is the California Spider. Um, then there's this car, which is right in the middle of the lineup. Um, they purposely make this car the best performing model, but also keep it relatively grounded in terms of price. And then there's the front engine V12 Grand Tourer, which is the high end, um, which is currently the A12 uh, super fast that car okay. walks out the door at four hundred thousand dollars base so there's a reason you know they've placed this car price wise very strategically but the way we've built it greg with the carbon wheels and the carbon inside and okay the, carbon but, outside, but the way you were talking about it before like the past few weeks I was expecting something well, well, well north of half a million. Well, I was hyping it up in that manner because no one buys a base Ferrari. I I'm mean, just, I'm just going to say this, okay? You just mentioned we're all having an existential crisis discussing this car. <laughs> this is an existential crisis money. I mean, yeah, this is not real. Like, the way we've outfitted it is yeah, very dear. We're yeah, probably, I think I'd venture to say we're close to a half a million dollars. Okay, but that's not what yeah. I was expecting. I was expecting something a lot more than that. Well, no, I mean, okay, if we're if we're close to half a million, that's you know, I mean. But so, what on. are we going to use for a real a real thing? Because all I have is base numbers here. Like we, we're we not, gotta We're going to have to do the same thing we did with the McLaren, which is to to use the base price and then admit. But none yeah. of the but we had an as tested well, price for the McLaren. We do not have an up, as look tested. Look up car and driver and see if they, I, I did, and there's no as tested. They only list base. Car and driver, road and track, motor yes, trend. None not of a single as tested price. Well, we've just got to go with the assumption that it's very very expensive and rate it based on look, that. I mean, look at how we built it: carbon fiber wheels carbon fiber engine bay, carbon fiber external bits, 
carbon fiber interior, the passenger LED display, Daytona seats, uh, carbon fiber wheels. Yeah, this is easily $200,000 in, in So, Austin. I mean, are you comfortable with us reviewing it at 480 grand? I don't think we can put a number on it. We and have to, to get our numbers. I mean, unless we just want yeah. to throw this spec sheet out because we can, honestly, we can throw the sheet out for this because we know it's going to, it's going to max out everything. And well, I mean, ultimately, you know, Vinny's the arbiter of stuff like this, but I just venture to say that, you know, you're going to be paying a lot of money, but you're going to be getting a lot of performance. And I guarantee you, price as tested for this car is probably very similar to the McLaren, which we also put all the carbon fiber well, bits didn't, on. Didn't because we only add about $100,000 to the price as tested? That was the road and track or car and driver prices tested. That wasn't the way we built it. Well, we they, had, put, they had a lot of the same options. Okay, but we put like basically every option on it. Yeah. The point is uh, the 720 built the way we built it and the Ferrari built similarly are going to be very similar in price because they're direct competitors to one another. Okay, so I mean... what. I would ask, what was the McLaren price again? 380? Let me pull, I, I want to say 340. Let me pull up the, I have the uh, the old sheet here. I'm, I'm, I'm Googling the different options. Like those wheels alone were- uh, 378, this is just, 315. It's just, you know, forum stuff, people talking, but those wheels alone are like 40,000. 40? Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe, yeah. maybe I was wrong about that existential crisis. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think it really affects our ability to, to rate this car because you know it's not going to be cheap. Well, I mean, no. but we got it for, for the spreadsheet to work, we have to give it a number. Just for because it's, it's a spreadsheet. That's well, what do you want to do about this, Vinny? I, this is your show. So, well, um, if the wheels are 40 and we can safely guess. Like, let's assign a number to all the upgrades. Like, what do we think price-wise there's? Well, that means each wheel is 10,000 bucks. I'd say, I'd say the exterior carbon package is probably 20,000 bucks. Ooh, minimum. that's way under what I was thinking. Because there's so much in their big sheets. Well, yeah, but it's more difficult to design a carbon fiber wheel than it is just True. to shape body pan, you know. Um, yeah. Um, the, the Daytona seats are probably $15,000. The carbon interior is probably more expensive than the carbon, carbon exterior, I would imagine. Um, so we call it 50 grand for all the carbon fiber. So 30 inside, 20 outside. Plus the carbon Ooh. engine bay. That's another 15,000, let's say. So then, and then 40 for the wheels. Right. So we're at 95 there. Right. And then, then the you said 15 seats, for the seats. I'd say roughly at minimum 15. So there's 110. Plus 2,000 for the floor mat. Easily. I mean, um, especially after what we saw with the NSX. Right. Um, um, and what other options did we have? Was that it? I think that was, that was it. it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if the base price is 280, then we're looking at 400 as built. So right. a lot, again, a lot closer to the, uh, and Nothing. I'm sure that if somebody will watch this who actually has a, a Ferrari and they're going to well, be like, you guys are morons, you know, have, have them leave a comment in yeah. the, uh, when we post this. Yeah. So let's go, let's go. For, uh, I'm good with the 400,000 number. If you are Vinny, do you feel, yeah, I feel I'm, like that's a little low, but again, I'm also way over. Stimulate. I, I thought, yeah, I thought it was going to be a lot more, but you know, Hey, $400,000 is not a little bit of money, but no. um, if we, let me, let me reiterate, if we had chosen to build the front engine V12 hyper uh, supercar, which is the A12 super fast and put this level of optioning on that car, we, you can get pretty much all the same options, carbon interior, exterior engine bay, carbon wheels, all of that stuff, you'd be looking at a $600,000 car. You know, that's their high-end 
regular model outside of the hypercar they do every once in a while, like the um, LaFerrari, which gets into what? the millions. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I think that kind of like threw me off, right? You hear about Ferrari selling for millions of dollars. Those are um, select, select hyper cars where they only build like, you know, 300 of them. And, and the only people who get to buy them are long term Ferrari clients, the factory right. calls collectors. You. Yeah. By, by the way, Rob calls you and says, we would be willing to sell you a La Ferrari if you want one. You can't buy one unless the for, the factory contacts you to see by, if you want. by the way rob this i just came across this uh complimentary maintenance covered for the first seven years unlimited miles mm. powertrain mm. warranty three years unlimited miles mm. so you have a, t- a time frame to drive the piss out of this car right and then but, yeah and and then you got then come back to then the you gotta get serious but I'm here to offer you your car's new extended warranty. So, oh. <laughs> could you, you imagine if you got... if you addressed one of those and you're like, okay, yeah. well, here's what it is. Here's what it is. It's a Ferrari F8. What kind of warranty can I get on it? <laughs> can we can we like uh, handicap this at all? Oh what God. way? What you... Here's I how with I the, would with handicap. the point system. Well, here's how I'm, I was intending to handicap it in all the areas where, you know, the X factors and stuff. It's a Ferrari. I mean, that's the answer for me. You guys aren't quite. As... No, I mean, with the price and the and the points. Well, I mean, we could handicap it with the price. I mean, that's that's kind of the handicap system, right? Is value. I mean, other, other than that. I, mean, I think we should just jump into this and keep referring to our McLaren numbers because, like I said before, this car is priced. Well, I should say the McLaren is priced to be competitive with the Ferrari. So, you know, optioned out cars between the 720S and the F8 are going to be, the prices are going to be very similar. So however we voted on the McLaren should be a good yardstick for how we should vote on this. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, that's, yeah. I expected this realistically to be North of 500,000. The way you were, you know, saying that this is going to be, I I don't know. I just, I guess. I. Well, we really don't know the number that our car would be at. It could be $400,000. It could be 500. I've never bought a Ferrari. Um, (laughs) You know, I don't have that experience. I could call some people who own them and maybe they could tell me, but not in time for this podcast. Oh, (laughs) we can go by what they're selling for. Oh, yeah. Well, but you have to bear in I, mind I, I these know, cars appreciate instead of I know. I depreciate. Know. So 2021 but, or 2020? 2021 F8 Tributo, 4899. Okay. So, so then we're good. 400,000. Yeah. Is that used or new? That's used. Used. Yeah. Because um, I just, I, I search fully optioned F8 Tributo and the first thing that you know comes what? up. It's a bunch of a bunch of crashes. You know what? I bet I bet you prices for these cars are at their apex right now because Ferrari was hit particularly hard by COVID. Um, the factory was closed for almost like eight months last year because Italy, if you recall, got got hammered mm. in the beginning phases of the pandemic. Um, so it could be, you know, production for 2020 Tributos was was minimal. Um, well, because there's also on that same website, there's a 2020 for sale for 364.999. Mm-hmm. So, so we split the difference, 400,000. Let's score this freaking right. thing. Gentlemen, did you enjoy your break? I did. I did cool. immensely. I drove drove around the Malibu Hills and no <laughs> break, but uh, I guess we're ready to uh, to rate this sucker, huh? 
yeah, yeah. let's score it. Let's see where it lands uh, with our guesstimated number. And uh, yeah. All right. So obviously first up is going to be power uh, at 710 horsepower and 567 pound feet. Um, it's obviously no number slouch. One. Like it's yeah. number one on the list. Right. Uh, by comparison, the McLaren 720S was the second and we gave it uh four and a half, four point seven, four point five. Well, this is obvious. I mean, so this obviously gets fives because it's it's the it's the high water mark, right? Right. So Do you know the torque figure out of yeah, five five sixty seven? Yeah, it's got a very high torque figure. A lot of hyper cars tend to have a lot more horsepower numbers than torque. I mean, there's a good split, 710 to, to 567. Yeah, that's that's a that that disparity is like uh well, pretty large. That, that tells me right off the top of right off the bat, it's high RPM. Mm. Well, it, I think this car redlines at 9,000 RPMs, if you can believe that. Uh, let's see if I can find that redline. There's not a whole lot of uh, 8,000 RPM red line. 8,000, okay. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of information available on this car, I found, which is... For a V8, what size is the, what size is the V8? It it's, is a... I know it's turbo and all that, but um, what? how big is it? Hold on, I just had... 3.9 liter. So it's a very yeah, small V8. Yeah, so it that that baby spins. That's so cool. that's, a, that's a pretty impressive torque number for such a small V8. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, twin small turbochargers for um, so that they spin up quickly, so there's no turbo lag. Um, and I've heard uh, reports that although it doesn't sound as good as the normally aspirated V8s, uh, in particular the 458 Italia Vinny, was always touted as being one of the sweetest sounding Ferrari engines ever made. V8s in particular. You know, they've got to make concessions now, like everybody else, to EPA standards in this country, which is the biggest market in the world for Ferrari. Um, you know, so now they're relying on force induction to to make up, um, you know, for uh, what were previously dismal um, mileage numbers. And well, you've it's got to remember, away. too, that, that a turbo is a, basically a rotary muffler when it comes to sound. Correct. It takes you know, a little yeah. bit, quite a bit from the sound, but they uh, reviews have said that as far as turbo engines are concerned, this is probably the best sounding turbo engine on the planet. So very cool. So next will be handling. Um, I, again, struggled to find skid pad numbers. Uh, the only one from not a very reliable <laughs> source, a little bit sketchy. I'm so um, surprised that there's not car and driver tests. Yeah, I mean, know, the car there. and driver n numbers are, uh, they're my go-to for these. Mm. And they're very sparse. They do not have uh, the skid pad numbers. Mm. They only have four figures on performance total. Wow. Uh, but the, the kind of sketchy one I found was 1.06G. Mm -hmm. So again... I mean, that's not the best in class. That's what? That's second? That that might be third. I think we had a 110 and a 108. Okay. Um, what about the Nürburgring? Uh, again, from a sketchy source, um, surprisingly, Nürburgring Times doesn't actually have a time for it listed. Uh, but the one sketchy play, and I, I say sketchy just because it's, I mean... Oh, it's internationalbanker.com, right? What the hell? Um, but it has it listed as, um, where I just lost seven minutes and 21 seconds. Where does that put it? Uh, on the, on the slower end of fast. Hmm. Um, this is a real shame that we don't have like bonafide. Yeah. Like, numbers because I mean, it seems like on most of the other cars although we did admit last episode that we were going to lay off Nürburgring times a little bit because they're kind of sketchy but at least we had solid skid pad and numbers for the yeah, other cars it's exactly kind of so I mean I, 
obviously the thing handles awesome, right? You said how fast, Greg? 740? No, 7, 723, 724. What are you looking at? Because I'm looking at internationalbanker.com right now, too. And it says, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The F8 covered yeah. the same track in seven minutes, 21. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What You're was right. the, uh, the, what's the skid pad leader? The McLaren? Yes. At, it was like 111. <sighs> Something like that. Yeah. It was, it was above, it was into the 110s. Um, and then the Nurburgring time for that, wasn't it, wasn't it like 708 or something? I believe it was a 7 This is kind of a shame because all these numbers being sketchy, I, I, we got to go by the numbers, but it, I would venture to say this car probably handles marginally, if not the same well, as McLaren, maybe marginally better. Just for, There is one downside that, the, that? For, that, the, that needs to come into handling, I guess, the weight. The Ferrari is 400 pounds heavier than the McLaren. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, okay, that? I'm reading a uh, Motor Trends uh, review of it, and they're talking a little bit about handling right now. And it says, um, uh, as for the figure eight, uh, the Tributo completes the task in 22.8 seconds at 0 0.93 average G's. Um, so I, I, that's not that's not a skid pad, but you know it's something. See, and that's the problem too, is not all of these cars were tested by the same people. On so, the same day. Yeah, so we're literally comparing, track. you know, numbers generated from outlet one with numbers generated from outlet two. But you see, here's the thing. When you take numbers for cars on different days, different temperature, different all of that, with like an outfit like car and driver, at the very least, you know, they had competent drivers pushing exactly. each car. I would have no so. problem comparing if everything was a car and driver number, I would have no problem. Right. Comparing. The yeah. problem is when you go to, uh, you know, Bank Joe blows. Whatever. Yeah. Joe blows website. One, two, three. Dot yeah. com. It's like, Oh my God. Like, do we trust them? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, what did we, I would venture, like I said, I happen to, I happen to just know that this car handles on par, uh, you know, in the realm of the McLaren. Neither car has been touted as being dramatically better or worse than the other one. They all considered these cars the best there are in terms of road car handling. What did we offer the McLaren in terms of scoring? 4.75 and 4.8. Say again? 4.75 4 and 4.8. I'd give the Ferrari the same thing. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to rely on these numbers completely, but at the same time, I don't feel confident that it outperforms the McLaren either. No, I mean, 400 pounds is a lot of weight in this, in this thing. And everything's kind of pointing to slightly less performance again, questionable sources, but still, um, well, what would you give it? Slightly if under. If I gave it a 4.8 before, 4.7. I think I'm comfortable with that. Because it's well. still an absolutely amazingly hand, amazing handling machine, right? Yeah. Like absolute numbers, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'd feel comfortable with a 4.7 as well. Vinny? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm bummed out, man. We, that we're not finding information on this thing. We don't have a solid price. What about this? Uh, what if we kind of give, a let down. What if we give this car temporary ratings right now? And in our next episode, whatever we end up doing, be it SUVs or sedans or something like that, I in the interim, I will take it upon myself to do some like more lengthy research where instead of us rushing because we're live. Um, I'll actually dig into it. And if I can find alternative numbers, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll certainly, our you know, and we might, uh, you know, build another mid engine. We've talked about it. There's, uh, another, I know that there's a couple other cars that we could potentially build, um, that Z06 might come out soon. Um, 
you know, mm-hmm. so we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I, I, yeah, let's do that, Rob. Right now, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a 4.75. So I'm in between the both of you. Okay. Okay. And then the next is the interior. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That's going to be very tough for me. Well, just, just, just actually, it's not tough. I just looked at our McLaren scores. Uh, McLaren's got fives across the board. Yeah. And yeah, like I, I love said, I don't think one takes other. away from the other. For me, no. anyway. So Maybe. for me, it's easy. It's a five. Like, it's a five yeah. for me. But yeah, it's a five um, for totally different reasons. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think that one was hard at all, actually. Uh, and yeah. then we got performance. Uh, I do have car and driver's performance numbers, which again, they're, they're limited, but I trust. Uh, 2.8 seconds to 60. Mm-hmm. Uh, 10.2 second quarter mile and a 211 mile an hour top speed. That's the fastest quarter mile we've seen, right? Yes. Uh, but no, it's something ten... else was 10.3, I think. Damn it, I wish we had written all these down. You said this one was 10.2. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But, I mean, something was right there. That's Yeah, I... so this is the fastest. Yeah, this... but not yeah. by a huge margin. You know what I mean? It's no, not like... but I do, having said that, yeah, it's a tenth quicker, I think, to the quarter mile than the McLaren. Yeah. But it's also, it happens to be, if I recall correctly, a tenth slower to yes. 60 yep. than the McLaren, yes. which the McLaren was, was 2.7. 7. So it's really a push. Well, um, about six, I mean, what about honestly, 60 to zero or 100 to zero? Yeah, no no breaking data for it. Really? Motor Trend had it. Really? I'm looking at, yeah. I'm looking at car and driver and there's no braking data. Hmm. How could all of these magazines have reviewed one of the premier performance cars on the planet and not, not done a full technical review? It's just weird to me. I bet you give, give me a week and I'll dig and I'll find some there, reliable numbers somewhere. There was a, there was a lot of information about on the Pista. They yeah. were comparing the two. There was a lot yeah. of information out there on the Pista. Um. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look at some European car magazines like Car, which is a big um, Euro mag. They do comprehensive tests. And the Euro version of this car is exactly the same as the U.S. There's no power difference or equipment difference or anything like that. So I'll dig it up. I'll find it. But basically, I mean, this is a five, just like the McLaren was a five. I mean, these cars are neck and neck. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not gonna knock. I'm not gonna attempt to knock it because we don't have some information. I mean, it's you know, it's the top tier performance uh, um, mid engine. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we we left we left a little bit of room in the uh, McLaren specifically for this. Mm, yeah. Because the McLaren was 4.8 and 4.7. No. Um, I'll give this a 4.9. Yeah, I'll do the same just because we're not sure of the numbers at the moment. But I mean, for me, the, the mark of a car in terms of like performance is generally quarter mile. And yeah, just, I think that's more important than zero to 60. Yeah, absolutely. Cause there are so many more factors that can affect zero to 60. Than... See, and that's, that's the opposite for me because quarter mile, the average person is not going to run it for a full quarter mile in their day to day life. No, but, 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 but we're talking about what we're, we're talking about. Yeah. We're performance, looking. not like, I'm, Oh, how I'm am saying, I going to drive yeah, it? But a performance that matters to me. Like, oh, oh! I see what you're saying to the average person. Yeah, but we're just going by cold numbers. And, yeah. Well, that's uh, what I'm saying. I, I because because of the cold numbers, they, I don't think a tenth here and a tenth here is a wash. I feel like that needs to be weighted. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, oh, and oh, right. because there is the tenth difference. Like, well, you not- did weight it because you gave the McLaren a four eight, and you're giving the Ferrari a four nine. So it no, it, but I, I'm not. I. I I'm saying if with that metric alone, I would actually rate the McLaren higher because I would give up a 10th on the quarter mile for a 10th to 60. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. wouldn't. Uh, To me, the quarter mile is the defining uh, metric for, I I, I get what you're saying, but do you race, do you race somebody to 60 miles an hour? No, you race them in a quarter mile, but that's the thing. 
the the actual power and and everything needed the performance of shaving a tenth off in six to 60 mile an hour is a big difference than losing a tenth at a quarter mile yeah but it's also extremely driver uh yeah and then you know exactly a quarter mile i think reflects more the true numbers of a car's performance whereas 60 the slightest I mean, bit of wheel spin or anything like that. Exactly. 60 but I mean, it's an automatic transmission. How much driver is there? Like, it's not like you're dumping a clutch. <laughs> like you're just smashing the gas. Yeah. Like, I, and I'm not so trying that to downplay bro- that. No, that, that bolsters Rob's argument to me. I mean, uh, not, not the, you know, to me, it's, yeah, it becomes more important. The, the quarter mile is, is, that's the metric, you know, and you say like, oh, well, you know, you're not going to be racing it on the street and this and that. And like that to me doesn't matter. You know, how a person drives this car is not my concern. My concern is, you know, the, those numbers and the quarter mile to me is more important. Yeah, I just I, I, I feel confident giving it a slight edge. Over I mean, it, it's still or, no matter or, what, it still gets an edge over the McLaren. Yeah. I'm for just saying. right now, let's let's keep putting that asterisk because you know these numbers are you know for right now i feel comfortable giving it a a slight edge over the mclaren but let's see if i can dig out you know some more accurate numbers later on and we can revisit this but uh, you know what do you give it for now greg i'm giving it a 4.8 which is a tenth above what i gave the mclaren oh you gave the mclaren a 4.7 yeah okay I give the Ferrari a four nine. I yeah, think. and you guys both gave it four Same. nines over your four eight. Like we we all yeah. bumped it up a tenth. Yeah, it's okay. just, I mean, like because you know when it comes to drag racing, if you take a tenth off your sixty foot, which is different than zero to sixty, but I know the sixties, uh, you take a tenth off down low, it's two two and a half tenths up top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but not in this case. No, not in this case, and it's all gearing. I mean, that's a hundred percent gearing. That's not a power. Well, yeah, uh, I know, I know you're very you are the tech guru, and so you're no, very no, concerned I'm, with the why and the and I, yeah, and yeah, I get the how and the why thing, those things work. I get that, and that's I'm how your brain saying, works, and I love you for it. But what I'm saying is like that is not a reason for me to to adjust my score. I'm not, you know? and I'm not trying to like I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm justifying my decisions. And for right. the record, that's it, not why I love Greg. <laughs> it it's it's it it sounds like you are discounting uh the fact that it's it's faster in the quarter mile by saying like oh but that's because of gearing and it's like well no, it doesn't I'm matter not why that it's faster in the quarter mile i'm saying i'm giving more weight to one being faster to 60 than i am the other one being faster in the quarter mile that's all i'm saying i'm putting Fair more enough. weight i'm putting more eggs in one basket than another basket that's all I'm saying. Fair enough. I hear you. Uh, and then, next? and then price. What? Yeah. What is next? Price. Price. Yeah. I mean, we gave we gave the the uh, McLarens threes across the board. Yeah. I uh, on the I I've thought about this subject before we actually went on air and. Um, there is for me this is just personally i mean the price of the mclaren the price of this car it's astronomical i would give a slight edge in this category to a ferrari if both cars were priced the same let's say hypothetically it's a ferrari and so for me personally that offsets just a little bit how dear the price is versus the McLaren. Like no one ever says, oh my God, this car's $400,000, but it's a McLaren. But people will say it's $400,000, yes, but it's a Ferrari in the same way they say yes, but it's a Rolex or yes, it's this or that. So we gave three threes across, threes the, board. across the board. I'll go 3.5. I'm not gonna lie. I'm a little surprised. As I expect you to give it like a four. Because no, I'm it's trying to be as honest as I can. You know, well, I, that I'm, I'm not saying you'd be being dishonest. I just, 
I figured it was going to get a bigger number from you because yeah. I know that Ferrari thing is very, very near and dear to you. It is. And that, that constitutes a half a point. You know, okay. this is still a ridiculously expensive car anyway that you cut it. And, you know, I'm not going to whitewash that in any way. I just think it's for that price, getting a Ferrari out of the deal would be more important to me than getting a McLaren. And yeah. that's worth a half a point. Well, I, I agree with you on the half a point for a different reason. Um, mm. I look at the price because the second you buy it, it goes up in value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, there's that, I mean, that alone but... gives it, gives it, makes it a better value. Right? Yeah. It I makes didn't it, even consider that. Yeah. Like it's a better investment. I mean, literally how many cars are there that when you buy it and drive it off the lot, it goes up in value. Like, Just that. Just so, I mean, Ferrari. That, yeah. that alone makes it a better, a better, the price, a better score for me. Mm -hmm. So, Vinny? Yeah, I've been trying to Google some prices just, and I can't find anything. So that sucks. But, um, you know, I was going to do kind of the same that you did, Rob. Uh, I went into this, like, assuming that they cost a lot more. So, the price that I heard, even the, you know, inflated price that we're kind of like um, guessing at uh, is still like not as bad as I thought. Right. So let's say it costs 450 grand, which I don't think it would. I think it'd probably be a little bit less than that. You know, even how we optioned it, um, even if it's 450 grand, uh, I think to your point, you know, it's um, money well spent because of uh, Greg, not only the investment, but also um, what you're buying, you know, uh, the value there uh, in the name and owning it and the prestige of ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd feel more comfortable about that. But I also, you know, what did I give the the McLaren? I gave it a three, right, Greg? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Three's across the board. But then I feel like I'm sliding the McLaren because that was a fantastic car at a lesser price. Um and so what I'm just, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to score the Ferrari higher just because it's a Ferrari. I don't know, because uh, I really love, I fell in love with that McLaren when we yeah. built it. Um, and so, man, I don't know. I, I would be inclined to give it like a higher score, maybe like a 3.5 <laughs> or 3.6. Um, but I have to temper that with what I just said. So. Well, just, just to throw point, this in there, I don't, I don't, before you give your price. I have those same feelings where I fell in love with the McLaren and maybe not so much with this. And I'm going to factor that because no matter how I cut it, I feel like this is probably your money's probably better spent on the Ferrari. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to temper that with my X factor. Mm, yeah. So I'm just, uh, just, I'm just throwing that out there. If that affects you. No, story. I have to do it. I have to do it here because okay. uh, we're talking about price, you know, and, and you got to do apples to apples. Uh, yeah. So I think I'd be at like a, 3.3 okay yeah. okay and then the next is x factor um I, I i can tell you right now rob's is a five right because what did i give the mclaren four point uh 4.8 yeah yeah i mean not only i gave the mclaren a 4.8 because of its extraordinary performance the interior that we all fell in love with there was very little not to like about the mclaren but you know in in summation it's a ferrari yeah. and i give it a five Vinny, yeah uh i gave the mclaren what 4.8 or 4.9 you and i both gave it a i five give it a five because we fell in love with it yeah i would uh i i'd give the ferrari i have to give the ferrari the same score i have to give five uh because um yeah like rob said it's a ferrari man it's it's like it's the it's the tip top you know yeah. that's the it's the best well here here's where i'm probably going to get some hate i'm only going to give it a 4.5 because if you handed me four hundred thousand dollars and you said pick one i'm still going with the mclaren you'd go all the way down to 4.5 from a five mm -hmm. that's a lot and that's only to offset the value because uh, i i'm not denying that if i was buying an investment the Ferrari makes more sense. But if mm. I'm voting with my emotions, what that five that made me fall in love with the McLaren, it's not here. Like 
Just and me. I'm not uh, Jesus. It's it's half a point. Like we're not saying I don't like the car. I'm just saying that falling in love isn't there for me on the F8. Mm. That that emotional trip isn't there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's still there's no denying all of its amazing, you know, attributes. Like there's nothing wrong with the car. It just that one little you know heartstring didn't get tugged. That's all. I, after doing all this, I man. If that scenario that you described, Greg, I, oh man, you know, I, I've always said like, I, Ferrari is my favorite when we talk about supercars, but after building that McLaren, I would, I would be, that would be a very difficult choice uh, to yeah. make for me. Yeah, it, it would. And the, the thing is, again, if you gave me that money and you said you need to invest it in a car, not something to drive, I'd, I'd have to buy the Ferrari. But if you said I'm giving you this so that you can drive the wheels off of something and have fun. I think the McLaren wins for me. You, you know, tell me the from, keys to any of these cars that we built and I'd have a good time. Yeah. And from the latter standpoint, let's admit the fact that, you know, if someone was going to give you anything, would it be a McLaren or a Ferrari or maybe a Lamborghini or maybe an Aston Martin? There are plenty of cars out there where, you know, where if someone's just handing you the money to buy it, I mean, let's, I mean let's be for realistic. me personally, it would be a Ferrari, but I know objectively, like Vinny loves Aston Martins. I love Aston Martins. Maybe, you know, the history and tradition behind that brand, which is marvelous, um, you know, would tug on his heartstrings. Um, well, I mean, let's, let's be 100% honest. Somebody really gave me $400,000 and said, spend this on, on cars. I would get the C8. And then I'd go get a GT500, and then I'd get a couple of Nissan 240s, and then I'd get, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, this, 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 these cars would not be um, the first on my mind if I just came into a lot of money. You know, I'd buy a, a triple black 71 Cuda, I'd buy yeah. a Copo Camaro, I'd buy, you know, yeah. those cars that I really, truly love and know the heritage of, right? Like, so I don't, I, there's a disconnect here for me, right? Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that, In but it would depend when I was handed that four, $400,000. If I already owned a 70 Cuda, which is a dream car of mine as well, um, I'd actually, you know, like Hemis are just so outrageous at this point, but like a 440 Cuda would do me just fine. And there's other cars that I love too, that I would love to own. But if I already own those cars in my collection and someone handed me $400,000, it would probably go to this car. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, if it was spend 400,000 on any car, I might agree with Greg. I mean, it might be a, you know, a Hellcat and a GT500 and a Cuda. And, you know, I love uh, the 70 Chevelle. Um, you know, there are lots of cars out there that would I could probably get and, you know, for 400 grand. But that, oh, yeah. Yeah. Out of all these cars, though, man, I'm really I'm going back and forth. I, 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 I really think it might be the McLaren. It might edge out the Ferrari. But, man, when you look at the if you just look at the outside, it's to me it's a toss-up well we haven't got to looks yet so yeah, I'll, I'll save that looks is next no go into it that's that's okay so yeah it's well uh i guess that's a good segue um yeah when you when you look at the outside to me it's it's a tie almost i gotta give like like uh like less than a tenth uh to you know to the ferrari because well you, you can the color that you gave you gave <laughs> you gave the mclaren a five so you can't that's what i'm saying no I, I can't but what i'm saying is like i'm just looking at the exterior you know I, if i was able to give it more than five i would um <laughs> there were things about the interior i didn't like as much uh with the mclaren um so i don't feel that bad about giving it a five because then it's just you know it's a wash like whatever extra points i would have given for the exterior you know i would have removed them for the interior anyways yeah. Uh, but God, man, you look at the outside of that car and it just looks like, uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. It's, it's near perfection. Like 
especially when you see it in person, every single line on the car is just, sometimes you look at a car, like let's take uh, recent Corvettes, for example, like the C7. I really liked the C7 when I first saw one. I was actually in Austin, Texas. I love the C7. And there was a black one in the parking lot at my hotel. And I walked around the car very slowly. And I was like, oh, I love the front. And oh, I love the side. And then I got to the rear and I saw the taillights. And I was like, yeah, like it just, the taillights didn't work for me. But overall, I loved the car. That's not the case on the F8. You walk around the car, there's nothing on it where you're like, eh, that doesn't quite make it for me. It's nearly, it's nearly perfect. And there are a few cars uh, for me that are like a 2003 Aston Martin uh, uh, Vanquish S. That's a perfect, des- a near perfect design as well. Um, Oh, I'm I'm looking. Okay, so I pulled up some photos of the McLaren 720, and I pulled up you know some more photos of the F8. It's no contest. It's actually there, there's a, a much greater uh, difference. If I could give the Ferrari a, a like a a six, I would, um, because it's it's gorgeous. The outside of the car is exquisite, man. Oh my god, and I I do love the McLaren. It's a fantastic car, but I think in my mind it was. Um, you know, I was, it was something greater and the Ferrari just, it, it, it eclipses it. Yeah. Well, it's a five for me on the car. Okay. Well, here's the thing I gave, I gave the McLaren a 4.9 leaving room for the Ferrari. Right. Um, it, it gets, it earns the five. That's for sure. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the McLaren, but, um, just looking at, at the F8, like I'm looking at the thing. There's there's nothing wrong with it. Like there's absolutely nowhere to ding it, right? No, it's, like there's no, it's great. I mean, those I, I it's just everything about it is right. Like yeah. it's not even it's not even an What's, emotional thing. Like this isn't even an emotional. Was, oh my god, it's there is nothing wrong with that car. Period. It's, it's like looking at a supermodel, and you're just like you're trying to ding her, and you just can't. Her legs are longer than yours, and her, you like, know, everything like, is just immaculate. What, I mean, if you what, literally uh, put a gun to my head and said, "Point out something you would change about this," okay, maybe I want the splitter to be a little bit bigger. What uh, what score did I give on the X factor to the um? the ferrari greg to the ferrari yeah you gave it a five damn okay yeah you like there's literally nowhere where you can you can bump this up unless you want to go to the price if you think it's worth a little more now (laughs) yeah actually i do um it's a much better looking car yeah so i would go uh to a four up to a four okay that's a big jump yeah yeah well i gotta offset it dude i would i would i would give the Ferrari a full point in the looks department over the McLaren. Okay. But I mean, I, I, I think I have to give it a five because literally looking at it, there is nothing wrong with it. Yeah. It's- Italians know how to cut suits, men's suits, and they know how to cut bodies for supercars. Yeah. I mean, the wheel. I thought you were going to say, <laughs> say for the mob. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, no, okay. I mean, aesthetics, you know, for me, for my whole life, like, you know, Italian this, Italian that in terms of aesthetics was always top. They did, you know, if you want something that works with precision, German cars are, you know, phenomenal. If you want something that is just like the embodiment of sex, it's, it's Italy. It's just the way it goes. Well, and know. then I do have one other place where I could critique them if I had to. And that would be the exhaust tips are nothing but cylinders sticking out of a beautifully sculpted butt. Mm. But it doesn't look bad. <laughs> like there's nothing wrong it doesn't with look it. Bad, but that, that is a point, Greg. Um, I was, I would have liked like quad tips, you know, like, or just or, something or... sculpted to match the angle of the back. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's like, always aftermarket. If, but I mean, if, that's the thing. It's like those are so, that. It's nothing that bothers me. But I'm saying I could nitpick. I'm not no, going to. You're right. It's a piece of crap. 
I <laughs> changed my score grade too. Yeah. <laughs> like I just I don't really think it's a problem, especially since you have three different tip color options and uh, yeah. It's it's going to be a 5 for me. I mean, let's period. get to uh let's get to the um the breakdown. Okay, well the breakdown, I mean the dollar per point. Uh it's $87 per point higher on oh, yours. Fuck. You were, I mean, you were 11, 11, 887 versus 11, 800. For me, the dollar per point went up a little bit more. Uh, it went up about $520 per point. Uh, I went from an 11, 782 on the McLaren to 12, 307. Uh, and then for Rob, it was, he split the difference, which is surprising because I thought for sure he'd be the, the lowest or the closest. Um, it, he's at 12.084 and before he was at 12.931. I'm sorry, 11.931. Um, so I, I just think that's just a function of the, the larger price tag. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah they're they're extremely close and And i think i think at least for me it's accurate because at the end of the day if i was buying one or the other it would be the mclaren um and what about the overall number oh the overall numbers uh they're they're all higher than uh than the mclaren Mm -hmm. the vinnie's for the ferrari was 33.65 and on the mclaren was 3205 for mm-hmm. me, it's 32.5 on the Ferrari, and it was 32.1 on the McLaren. Mm-hmm. And Rob, you're 33.1. No way. Rob. Oh, please. Oh, no, no, no. I read that. I was really, my brain was like melting out of my ear. No, <laughs> you're, you're 33.1 on the Ferrari, and you were 31.7 on the Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My brain, I was like, yeah, you scared me. I was like, what just happened there? I was I like, know. oh no, I have to buy a McLaren instead. Yeah. <laughs> Rob's like, I'm, I'm not a Tifosi. No, I'm a, I'm a phony. Yeah, well, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the, for me, the allure of the word Ferrari, uh, accounts for a lot. And, um, <clears throat> when you, add that to very similar performance to the McLaren. It's, it makes sense that the Ferrari just edges it. Um, and, you know, and- it would be my end all be all. There are not many things in this world that, that, you know, that are tangible, physical, viable things, um, you know, that would be better you know, more of a bang for me than, than owning an F.A. Tributa. So. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, for me, because it's not that big of a deal, like, I, I, I don't mean to say it like that, but it's the Ferrari thing isn't, I could scratch that itch by going out and buying a 2004 360. I'd get mm-hmm. that, I, the same, it's just like, you know, Vinny and I, we've, we've talked about the MP5, right? With the 22, it scratches that itch for me. Mm-hmm. Um. I think I could scratch that itch much more affordably with a 360, a used 360. Mm. Um, so you know, and for, and that's um, a good point, actually, because, you know, there are eras and there are cars within eras, you know, like, for example, my end-all be-all car of all time, the car that was allegedly Ferris Bueller's best friend's father's car, which was a 1960, uh, no, sorry, 1961 Ferrari 250 GT California Spider short wheelbase. In the movie, it was actually a Corvette with a kit body that they destroyed, thank God, and not a real uh, <laughs> Ferrari because the, the California Spider now auctions for close to $20 million uh, in today's money. But like I would... The twenty million dollars aside, like if someone said to me, "Just forget about money, forget about investment. Which would you rather have? A sixty-one Ferrari two fifty GT California, or an F eight Tributo?" 
I, I actually would go for the, the California, even though, you know, it's slow by comparison. It's like a seven second zero to 60 car, which was like yeah. state of the art in those days. But now it's like, you know, a, a, a Honda sedan is faster than that. But Rob, the music I'm, it makes in the, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm curious. Okay, so you've said that like, this is your end all be all car right uh before you start talking about the classic for um yeah. the f8 so i'm i'm curious is the f8 th that car because it's a new car or will whenever the next model that replaces the f8 will that become your new end all be all no it's not like that because like you know they could replace it with a model where the looks just don't get me in the guts like this car does this is my end all be all of new cars, but there are cars I'd rather have than this. I, I'd venture to say if you offered me a 70 Hemi Kamuda in triple black against, you know, this car, I'd probably go for the Cuda. But, you know, if you're talking about new cars and price was no object, this is where my money would land. But gotcha. I'm, a, I'm a car historian, you know, I've been in love with cars all my life and there's plenty of cars that I could think of that would come before this, including that 61 California, which is my ultimate, like I, I would love a 54 300 SL Gullwing Mercedes. I mean, I think that's one of the most beautiful cars ever designed. I would probably choose that before an F8, but you know, balls to the wall, modern performance car. It, to me, it's the ultimate car on the market right now. Well, now, now here's a Fair question, enough. Rob. And and sure. why why do you not own like a 360? Because they're affordable. Um, and and I I mean I know you could probably walk out and and buy a 360 right now. You know, right now, uh, dollar for dollar, I I. I'd re I mean, my two great automotive loves really in terms of brands have always been Mopar and Ferrari. That's just my personal taste. Um, I'd be happier with a Hellcat right now than a, than a 360 Modena. I mean, I, I agree with you. I feel like yeah, the, I mean, the, it the Hellcat's a much more car. Yeah. I mean, the Modena at the time that it came out was spectacular looking it was very dramatic design and it's aged well but it 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 just it's not one of those cars that get me gets me in the gut you know see and it, it does for me simply because of when it came out and at what point of my life i was at yeah like, that it, was the shit when yeah like if, if i was gonna go well i wouldn't because but i'm saying if somebody was like oh you should get a ferrari i'm like well that's actually an affordable ferrari that still does it for me emotionally yeah for me to fulfill my ferrari dreams it has to be you know that wouldn't be the car to do it i mean i'd be proud to own it but um you know for me i'd want something very very old like the california spider or cutting edge brand new that's really where my my dreams lie okay um but that's not to disparage the modena at all because i i remember it like it was yesterday the first time i saw one i was actually believe it or not right on rodeo drive i had a dentist whose office was on rodeo and I was uh, on my way. I had just parked my car and I was walking to the dentist's office and there was a canary yellow brand new 360 Modena sitting there. And I had to stop, even though like I was kind of late for my appointment, I had to walk around it. And like you said, at that time, the, I mean, the Modena looked like a spaceship. I mean, it would, that design for that moment in time just was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, conversely, there have been Ferraris that just doesn't quite do it for me. Like the current California, the entry level Ferrari, I see them and it's just not that special to me. Like I wouldn't run out and get one or spend a, a heap of money on it. The, um, the four-wheel drive model which was called the ff i forget what it's called right now it has a number 
instead of um, FF um, doesn't do it for me. You know, they don't they don't hit me every single time. This car hits me. Yeah, um, no, I, I get that. I do. Yeah, uh, gentlemen, um, we've been going at this for a little while. Yeah. I'd like to end this episode uh, by reflecting on um, not any car in particular, but just what we did, you know, by building all these cars and what we learned from, from doing this, right? So we set out with a goal in mind. It had to do with the Corvette versus the world. Um, and now that we, we have effectively done that, um, what, are your, what are your thoughts? The Corvette stacks up so well, it punches above its weight. I mean, sure, it's not beating this 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 Tributo, right? It's not beating it, but it can be mentioned in the same sentence without any shame on either part. Um, the Corvette has acquitted itself well. I think Greg like just nailed it with the phrase "punching above its weight." The idea that you know you could get a car that performs as well as the Corvette does for 60 grand is just it's hard to wrap your mind around it kind of because we've tested cars you know they might outperform it this ferrari the mclaren even the uh the nsx to a degree but you see how dear the price of this level of performance is and knowing for under triple digits, well under triple digits, that you can get three quarters out of that, that uh, of the performance. Oh, and for, it's more than three quarters. That's the thing. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just, I mean, in terms of zero to 60, it's just, you know, it's insanity what they did with Corvette. I keep seeing news items for the Z06. It was recently spotted, like within the past couple of days at the Nürburgring. Um, in camouflage. I had had a big old wing on the back of it, which wasn't exactly to my liking, but I, I'm really like looking forward to the Z06 and if there is to be a ZR1 as well. Um, is the Corvette a world beater? No, but it's world-class. It's definitely a world-class car for the money. And... Uh, I think GM uh, should be applauded for the effort um, because, you know, they not only did they know their market, but they outdid what their market expects, you know, which is already admittedly at a high level. Um, you know, people think of Corvette and they think of high performance. Um, the C8, you know, gives them more than most people expect who are looking to to buy a, a corvette without a doubt yeah it's uh you know when i reflect on on what we did and i start to think about the corvette and uh, where it stacks up against the rest of these cars um you know i come to the same conclusion that you guys do uh you know if you're getting 85 90 percent of the performance of the rest of these cars or the the, the top tier cars out of a car that you can purchase for a fraction of the price, uh, that's a win, right? And in a world where General Motors is not known for really listening to their customers um, and, and, and giving them what they want and ask for, uh, when their competitors are doing the same thing in the arena, right? When we look at uh, the Camaro, when we look at, um, you know, the Silverado, uh, we look at some of the other vehicles that they make. Um, it's kind of scary, right? Like, oh, what are they going to do with the, the fabled Corvette? Uh, but to your point, Rob, they, they really stepped it up and they listened to the consumer, right? And they, they looked at what other, the, their competitors were doing in the market. And they said, we can, we can do that. Right. And they get very, very close. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a massive win for Chevy, a uh, massive win for General Motors. And um, I thought this was a really fun experiment. I appreciate you guys uh, coming in and taking part. And, you know, your opinions are uh, 
as valuable uh, as anything to me. So uh, this was a lot of fun. Well, what's yeah. really cool too is if you think about it, right? Everything we've said about the Corvette has kind of had like a verbal asterisk to it mm-hmm. with the Z06 and the ZR1. Mm -hmm. there may not be an asterisk yeah i mean we might have to revisit this segment once those those cars are out and the figures you know performance figures are available they're talking 600 horsepower in the zl1 uh sorry in the z06 i mean mean, Um, seriously let's let's just think about it for a second if we could match every one of these actual performance things and it even bumped up the price 80 grand mm mm-hmm we're still, it's still the best value on the, on the ticket. And well, and think you, about what the C8 did with just a, I mean, it, it's, it's weird in this day and age to say it, but with like 400, what did it have? 480 horsepower? Four, 495. Yeah. 495. Yeah. Look at what the car was able to do compared to 710 horsepower cars in, in a, the same segment. I mean, it's insane. If a Z06 has anywhere close to 600 horsepower, this might be a different ball game, you know? And then what happens with the ZR1? I hope there is a ZR1, and I hope it's... I, I, uh, I had this gut feeling when those, those camo pictures came out, because if you notice, there's one with and one without the wing. I did notice that, I yeah. wonder if that's a Z06 and a ZR1. I, I don't know. Just it's saying, I mean, I'm just... I hope me- they can. I, I really hope they can squeak it in before cafe standards like doom all of these cars because we know it's coming. Um, you know, uh, with uh, there's just announcement after announcement that you know, normally aspirated or forced induction um, ice engines are going the way of the dodo. Tim Kaniskas said as much, he said, you know, the Hellcat engine i think his exact words were is a quickly dying breed you know and then we had the release the f the stellantis release uh the teaser with the next generation muscle car is going to be electric so i still think that's going to be an electric option not all i hope so i hope so because you know as much as i'm I'm cool with electric cars helping to save our environment. And you just look at this week's news with the hurricane and the flooding in New York, there's something that has to be done clearly. But at the same time, I'm also, you know, I'm an internal combustion guy and uh, I will lament the death of internal combustion engines. Hopefully I'll have a nice collection of them here, you know, that I can keep and savor as they go the way of the dodo and the market. But uh, let's hope, let's hope Chevy gets a, a ZR1 out there before this, the party's over. Gentlemen, um, thanks again. It's been a journey. Uh, thanks until next time. Me. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Greg. Uh, with that, I think uh, we should sign off. What do you guys think? Adios. At Silver Sport Transmissions, we believe classic cars and trucks look their best on the open road, and four wheel drives belong on the trail. We continue to innovate and develop the best overdrive transmission packages for muscle cars, street rods, classic trucks, and four-wheel drive vehicles. Our commitment to customer service and integrity is second to none. When the wrenches begin to turn, Silver Sport Transmissions is there. Hit the trail with Silver Sport Transmissions. Well, there you have it, Greg. Um, you know, I know this was a long one, but, but uh, we had a, a lot to unpack, right? We talked a lot about, uh, you know, not only the F8 Tributo, what a fantastic automobile, but uh, we also talked about uh, the Corvette and where it stacks up in this shootout. Um, we learned a lot. We talked about uh, a lot of the performance and stuff, and I, I really enjoyed the, the metrics um, with which we, you know, measured each car against each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, we I've, had to I've, talk about the Corvette because ultimately that's what this whole thing was about, right? Was the yeah. Corvette. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, this episode was about, this particular episode was about the F8. But 
uh, overall, the whole shootout was about that Corvette versus the world. Yeah. And so, you know, we don't need to beat that with a dead horse. You uh, and um, and Rob hit the nail on the head uh, with, you know, where it stacks up. It was a good time. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, everyone at home. Um, Greg, do you have anything else you want to add as far as all that's concerned? No, I think you've uh, you've covered it all. Right on, man. Well, um, we want to thank you guys for uh, sticking with us, um, you know, tuning in. Uh, do us a favor, leave a comment in the comment section below. Hit that like, comment, subscribe button. Let us know, you know, what kind of shootout we should do next if we do another one. Um, you know, it was a lot of fun. We like doing this stuff and, and we couldn't do it without you guys. Uh, we also couldn't do it, do it without our sponsors. Uh, that's Performance Distributors, Pro Charger, ARP, Liquid Molly, Silver Sport Transmissions, Holly Performance Brands, Optima, Performance Online, and of course, our title sponsor, Lucas Oil. So shout out to all of them. Uh, go check out their respective websites and, uh, you know, I'm sure they'll have something you need. So, uh, you know, they're great. They support us. And, you know, they're another big reason why we do this. So without further ado, I guess we should call it a night, Greg. Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll see you guys next time.